morning again, commissioners. Uh, for the record, Corey Chick, license and pass, um, section manager. Um, actually, if the chair wouldn't mind, if I can have John Frano come up, and it's absolutely, and it's not that anything can't be done. I'm sure we can do just about anything. It's that if we can do it in the time frame that y'all might be asking for. Great. So. Welcome, Mr. Frano. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is John Frano. I am the licensed draw coordinator for the state. Um, to your, can we use the qualifying licenses? I do not know if we currently can have that set up in time for next year uh, for a small game license, an annual fishing license, the big game licenses. Um, if the commission did want to just have you purchase a license before you could do a draw, we could set up a new product that was a qualifying product to get into the draw. That would be, from my knowledge, something that could be done for next year. But I'm not sure if the system currently allows us to look back into what you had the year before and say yes or no if you can see those products or not. Commissioner McDaniel, do you have any thoughts on that? I know you're the most involved in the well, I have a question for John. I'm a little confused by what you said. We have that now. That you have to, um, what we were just talking about, you had to have a qualifying license. And that bypasses the preference point. So I'm kind of at a loss as to what's new. Commissioner McDaniel, that's done after the fact. After the draw. Correct. What you're more talking about is the, in, in, yeah. is the Kansas model. So Kansas has a product that you buy up front. Mm -hmm prior to applying for the draw. So we know that functionality exists, but the way we do the, the preference point and whether you're charged a fee is completely after, after the draws ran. And then we run a program that gives us all those that did not have a qualifying license, and then they're charged the preference point fee on the back end. I got you. Uh, it would seem like a spirit does, because Kansas, Utah, Arizona, and Wyoming all require a license to be purchased before you can submit an application. And to that point, you, it may be in there. I, I just don't know about yeah, it. We yeah, haven't obviously got Obviously not, so not in ours, but may, if a spirit does, I think most yeah, of those. It, it would be something that we could look into. On. And the nice thing is, is a spirit will be here tomorrow, so I can, <laughs> I mean, I know y'all are wanting to make a decision now, so it doesn't help. I can go try to make a call and try to find out if this functionality exists currently. You know, Corey, I think that's, this is going to just, I think what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this memo and this is going to keep happening. We're, we're going to get to things where commissioners want to change from staff recommendations. So it might make more sense for you to just be in the front taking notes so you can make one phone call. Okay. Um, Maybe share one more question on before they sure. do it. Commissioner Garcia. We already know the number of people who are doing this and, and that would be looking at preference points who are also already have a qualifying license versus those who don't. We already have those numbers, don't we? I guess I'm not under. How many people, we, we don't have any idea of how many people would be seeking preference points that would not have a license otherwise. And I could tell you what happened last year, Commissioner. If the, OK. Please. Sorry. I mean, I, I could get that data as far as what happened last year, but as far as for this year, it's. No, last year would be fine. Okay. I'm just curious what part of the population we're talking about, because I think Marvin would agree we're concerned about those people that do not have any qualifying license. And if it's a very small piece, that's different than if it's a very large piece. I think, um, Commissioner Haskett. Thank you. I think what we're talking about doing is doing away with what the previous year was and everybody buying a qualifying license this year. So it really doesn't matter what they had in the past. That's my understanding too. So If that's the route we're gonna go, correct. But I thought we were trying to find out what the effect would be. Please. Um, so if we are doing just what was sold this current year, so if you 
purchased, say, a fishing license, annual fishing license for this current year, I do believe that is possible um, because we can look at current year and then make a product appear if you have that on your record. Um, the issue that I was having with it is I didn't know if we could look on a previous year to do that. So, thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Daniel, let's just restate what it is the commission just told you. I know Mr. Chick's going to check, but <coughs> I just want the, the motion to be clear because this is obviously one of the most important things we do this year. Um, so my understanding is that they, there would be, they would have to have a qualifying license from the current year to avoid paying the preference point fee. Correct. That's my understanding. Good. Um, next item then, please. Okay. Um, so the next item was the... Excuse me. Oh, Commissioner Bray. I'm not sure that's exactly what no. we said. No, yeah. no that wasn't. Fine. We said you're going to have to buy a license period and then we're going to have a preference point right. fee. We're going to have both. That, I think that's what we're yes. communicating. Yeah. With that correction, thank you, Commissioner Bray. I think that just points out we've got to be very careful here <laughs> when we get to And how much would the commission recommend that preference point fee be? Similar to staff's recommendation on? Which was 40 and 100, is that what I remember? 40 for elk, deer, and pronghorn, 50 for sheep, goat, and moose residents, and then $100 for non-residents. That's fine with me. And zero for bear? Correct. That's Commissioner Vigil. <laughs> Just keeping the record clean. I'm not chastising anyone. Uh, okay, I think we have that one, Danielle? Yes. Let's go to the next, please. Um, so the next was what we want to do with um, black bears and if we want to do um, any kind of companion pricing or not. So staff's recommendation was kind of twofold. It was the um, list B and list C recommendation, adding those seven bear DAUs to the list B and list C designations, as well as applying a, an additional discount for concurrent rifle bear licenses and all private land only bear licenses to be a $48 price for residents and a $250 price for non-residents. Commissioner Bray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I support the uh, B and C designation I think the 250 on the non-residents too high. I would support a hundred dollar. Commissioner Haskett. Um, I agree with Com Commissioner Bray, um, and I did a little research, and I'd like to tell the other commissioners some of what I did find. Commissioner Haskett, would you get that microphone a little closer? Please? Is that better? Yes. Thank okay. You. Sorry. Um, Part of our job is to manage wildlife, and unfortunately, I don't think we do bears very well. All of the licenses that um, we have out there, whether it's over the counter or in the draw, um, are not purchased at this time, which to me says that the fee is a little too high. And with that, the success rate for our hunters in the field is around 7%, which is pretty low, which also means we're not getting the harvest that we need. And if you look at the numbers, um, let me back up actually. How many times in the spring to fall do you turn on the TV and you hear there was a bear problem somewhere in this state? It's a constant thing. <laughs> if you look at the numbers, what we spend on staff hours and time, it's a lot. And I think it's a lot more than it would be by changing a license fee. In the last, um, three years in just the northwest corner, which is where I think we have the least bear problems in the state, we spent over a quarter million dollars in staff time. That doesn't include the claims that we're paying for sheep, for honey, for all kinds of things. If you added that for all four regions, I think the number would be huge. I know it's a big change, but I think we would end up saving money by going to $100 for non-residents and going with the 250. And we need to encourage that. We're, what we're doing to the bears isn't necessarily fair to them because their population is increasing and we're not managing that. So I think we need to manage it. Mr. Haskett, 
could, just because I'm trying to manage to <laughs> clear motion, how do, how do you feel about Commissioner Bray's numbers? Because I think you're largely in agreement with him. But. I am agreeing with him. I would actually like to see a little lower, but 100 bucks is, is, a, is a good start. Let's see what happens with that in a year and then go from there. Commissioner Vigil. I would agree with the $100. I, I, I think uh, Commissioner Haskett pointed out some of the costs, but there's other costs. I mean, in the southern half of the state, we are losing a lot of baby elk, a tremendous amount of baby elk, and it's primarily there. There's other predators involved, too, but uh, the study that was done in, Me in New Mexico, which borders Los Angeles County and Costillo County, it, it's evident that the bears are just wiping out our elk calves. I, I was just telling somebody earlier, I had uh, 12 head of cows uh, on my property the other morning. It wasn't a calf in the bunch. It was just adult cows. That's scary uh, because there should be at least six calves or something like that, and there were zero. That's anecdotal. But the study that New Mexico did that borders the San Luis County and, and uh, Costilla County pointed it out. It was, they did a, a thorough four-year study. And the primary uh, cause of death of baby elk is bears. Commissioner Zimmerman, I think. Oh, and, sorry, Commissioner. And, 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 we're, and we're not getting, having any success in, in, in getting it. I mean, you're a prime example. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfair. Zimmerman. I just had a, a follow-up. Commissioner Haskett, thank you for the, those numbers and that, that research. Um, one of the things that stood out, if, if, only, if success rate in the field for hunters is only 7%, why would reducing the license fee, would that increase the 7% success rate? Well, first off, Commissioner we're not... Haskett. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. We're not even selling the licenses that we have out there. And we're cons conservative in what we issue to start with, but at a 7% 7 7 success rate, we're not even, our harvest is, is just too low for what we're trying to get. And we're, the one thing I wanted to say is, um, why don't we have more hunter opportunity instead of how many bears we euthanize a year? Let's try to get more people out there to help us instead of having the staff do it. Commissioner Zimmerman. I, yeah, I think I'm just confused on hunter's success rate. How do you improve the success rate? I mean, I, I agree biologically, I definitely want to support the wildlife, you know, the quotas and the harvest quotas and, and that, the, that our biologists put forward and, and do a, a great job of, of managing that um, to give us those numbers. But I'm just trying to understand, is it just because of the nature, maybe this is a question for Chairman Howard, is it just because of the nature of, of, bear, of hunting bear? I have, I have not yet been on a, a bear hunt, so um, maybe it's Murray? just the nature of how it works, 7%. Well, let's go to Commissioner Garcia, and then we'll take the expert on bear hunting from yeah, Commissioner yeah. Bray. <laughs> That's my question, and it's related. I agree with the $100. It makes sense to lower it. But I, too, am concerned that if we're talking about his management, is I'd like some ideas on how we improve on the 7%. I know that 7% of a few more licenses is more, but it's not huge. Uh, the unsold licenses, if they were sold, if we're still at 7%, doesn't solve the 7% problem. Do you have any thoughts, or maybe Commissioner Bray, any thoughts on? Commissioner Bray, could you also, when you answer that, could you fill in how the historic tools for hunting bear are not applicable in our state. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll start with that one. We have a constitutional amendment that says we can't hunt bears prior to September 2nd due to dependent young. We can't use bait and dogs. We can't have a spring bear hunt. All of those prior to that uh, amendment were effective tools to hold bear populations down. So what we have left is a method that we can adjust our method of take during the month of September. We have the month of September to hunt bear. Practically, yes. We'll kill a few bear in October and even, I've even killed a bear in November, but it's rare. To answer uh, Commissioner Zimmerman's question, to get more licenses 
in the month of September, yes, should increase bear harvest because that's when we got the most. So we should give every archery hunter a bear tag. That's my opinion for the cost of printing the doggone thing. But uh, <laughs> but we'll also increase our rifle. There's a lot of people hunt deer and elk, uh, but and a hundred dollar a non-resident or a forty-eight dollar resident fee to buy a companion <laughs> bear license. I think would be an incentive. I think we can raise that seven percent. But it's a timing issue. There's no point in giving bear licenses in November and December. We collect the fee, but there's you're wasting your time. You gotta. And then we as an agency need to continue to promote the legislature to look at expanding this division's authority to handle bear. We came pretty close here a couple of years ago in the legislative session of of getting some help and some relief and it didn't go. But I think with education and agency and DNR support, I think we could go back to the legislature and perhaps get some relief on the dates. You know, that would be a step. Thank you. Just, uh, Commissioner Vigil. On, on uh, the success rate of 7%, if you have more hunters and your success rate is still 7%, you're gonna kill more bears. Right. And, and that's one of the objects to manage them is whether it stays 7% or it goes up, you're still gonna kill more bears. Right. Um, I would like staff to, I know they put an idea in that I'm interested in, which is the concept of getting hunters out weeks at a time in September so that we fill up the entire month with hunters. And I think that's an idea for next year to be thought about. Um, I, and I think that has a lot of, it creates, it's not as good a tool as the tools we've lost, but perhaps that would help us um, in addition to the lowered fee. So um, I think the plan is to report on that next year, right? Correct, Chairman Howard. That's part of our big game season structure discussion topic list that we're going to be exploring through this public engagement process over the winter into next spring. Great. Thank you. So let's summarize where we are unless there's other comment on, on this one. Um, Danielle, you want to take a shot at what you heard and then we'll see if commissioners agree. Um, so I have that there is support for the extending the list B and list C as recommended by staff, but that the um, discounts for the concurrent rifle bear license and the PLO bear licenses should be $100 for residents and $48 for residents. Is that correct, $100 and 48 Commissioner Bray agrees. Mm -hmm. um, commissioners, I wasn't on the phone call. I know there was some, I think there's general philosophic agreement. We have that, it seems like. But I know there was a discussion about the numbers. Um, do we need to discuss that further, or are we settling in on the $100 number? Commissioner Vigil. On the conference call, uh, the staff had recommended $250, and I recommended that a range of 100 to 150 So that's what I got out of the conference call. But if, if we're, we want 100 that's fine. I'm fine with 100 Any comment, director, from you or from staff on, on that number? Okay, Daniel, I think that's then this item is $100 uh, is the number. Just a, a, oh, a closing comment. Commissioner Vigil and then Commissioner Zimmerman. When I was in high school, and I mean that goes back a long time ago, uh, a deer tag was $7.50. And with it, you were given a bear tag. And it was amazing because there were no bears in Southern Colorado. Right? <laughs> uh, but you always got a free one. So we're not making like huge jumps right now by going to 100. <coughs> I guess percentage-wise it is from zero to 100 is, is a lot. <laughs> well, I, I just will comment that many of the out-of-state hunters have told me when I'm sitting watching uh, Perry Will check in, you know, bears and things like that, that the, you know, when you pay $650 for your elk tag and then you have to pay 350 for a bear they just don't buy the bear tag mm -hmm. and, and so I mean I do think this it'll be interesting to see if it's if it actually does give us more um, but I think the need is there in the perception so 
Great. Uh, Commissioner Bray. I have one general comment too. And uh, number one, I have the highest respect in the world for our staff and Corey and his, his group. I'm a little tired of hearing that Aspira and IPAWS can handle an issue that we needed to handle. And you see it constantly through here. And I'm granted, give it a year, 2020, but I'm really, really tired of when we come t to an agreement on something we want to do and it can't be done because we can't program it. I thought this expensive program we've been working on ever since I've been on the commission was supposed to make it better and quite frankly it's made it worse and maybe this is a lecture for Aspira tomorrow because I don't think it's Corey's shop that's the issue. I think that would be a unanimous vote if I called for it. <laughs> uh, okay, I think you've got what you need, Daniel. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, so you ready for me to move on to W15 and P7? Are the other general changes for W0 and W2 or just the license fees to implement future generations? I don't know if there's any other discussion needed about that. Yeah, I'm going to take public comment now from Mr. Hildy, unless commissioners have comments. Mr. Hildy, please come up. For our new commissioners, I should say that Mr. Gates and Mr. Hildy are some of our most faithful supporters. They uh, come to all of our meetings and provide a lot of input. So it's, it's always good to see Mr. Gates and Mr. Hildy. Thank you, Chairman Howard. I was a little bit worried you were going to make a motion and I was bouncing up and down there. But, uh, so uh, my name is Steve Hildy uh, for the new commissioners. I'm with, I'm a volunteer for the Colorado Bow Hunters Association. The Bow Hunters Association has been in existence for 49 years. We're all volunteer. Our last membership report that I saw a couple months ago put us at about 2,200 members. So uh, in terms of the discussion here today, I, sitting in the audience, I'll let you know, I'm a little bit confused over if you're saying we need to buy a fishing license and pay $40 to get an elk point. Um, if that's what you're saying and that's what passes, I think you're going to get a lot more emails on that. So I have some caution on that. I would like to comment on really a number of items that Danielle called out. And first I'll go to application fees. And I'd like to remind everybody that, you know, there are, I believe it's 10 big game species in Colorado. Uh, you can apply for one sheep and I believe mountain lion are over the counter. So you might incur in a single year eight applications fees. Uh, if you're a family of four, um, multiply that by four. And uh, in discussing this with the CBA board, for uh, not sheep, moose, and goat, but for everything else, what we support is we'd like to see a $5 fee for residents and a $10 fee for non-resident. There's a slight variation there, and I'd like to explain why. If you look at the ratio set in the future generations bill, it's 10 and 20. 5 and 10 is consistent with that. Uh, as well, if you look at credit card fees, they're very different for re residents and, and non-residents, and I'm referring to merchant fees. I don't know what we pay, 2.8, 2.25, but that's a lot different on a $600 elk tag than a $50 resident tag. And then uh, secondarily, one thing that I would add is we're incurring an $8 increase in these licenses. And so a deer tag, I believe, is what, $30 today? And so that person who uh, buys next year is going to see the $8 fee increase and it would be another $3.75 if you go up to seven. That equates to a 39% increase that that guy's going to have. And one of the things that I'll mention is, you know, as we were discussing this future generations bill a couple of years ago, I went out and I Googled, 
median incomes based on counties in Colorado. And a lot of rural Colorado, median incomes are at or near poverty levels. And so in taking the position that we're at and lowering that a little bit for residents, we'd really like to see families continue to participate. And we'd like to see residents continue to participate because those are the guys who are going to vote if we get into a ballot initiative scenario. So on uh, just solely application fees, that's where we're at. If we start talking about preference points, uh, you know, I think we're at a very different place for sheep, moose, and goat. Uh, our survey, which I shared with the commission some time ago, uh, and I think it was August, we surveyed and got responses from 500 people, and 93% of them said they'd rather re-implement pay up front. And what we've said is, tell us what that costs, and we'll pay that in our application fees. You know, in speaking with Commissioner McDaniel yesterday, you, you nailed it, and your input guy nailed it. When we shifted to pay uh, later, and we saw the huge application increases, and you got all the in, in emails, what happened was people lost hope. There was hopes and dreams, and I've drawn a moose tag, and I had those hopes, and I had those dreams, and I'll still apply for the cow tags. But uh, you can restore hope by uh, going back and reverting to pay up front, and you know nobody really loses money in that scenario because when you don't draw, you get it back, and we'll pay the fees that are associated with that. So that's where we're at as an organization. Um, it, with preference points. Now, I've also heard, uh, for those three species, I've also heard uh, the board and many folks say, for sheep, moose, and goat, we're, it takes a minimum of three preference points. Maybe we ought to move that to five. Uh, you know, what happens if we get another 300,000 applications this year? So we're asking you to raise that minimum to five as well. And, and maybe it's not in this discussion. Maybe it's as we continue to discuss preference points. Also wanted to talk about bear a little bit. And uh, so there's some confusion on my part, but I believe we support discounted companion licenses. And I believe why we support that is because you got to have an elk or a deer tag. And so my understanding is we're not putting more hunters into the field. It's the same number of hunters. It's just more people will have bear tags, which will lead to an increased harvest. So we do support that. And we'd also say that we would support and request an extension to the archery season for bear only. You know, right now it ends uh, based on our season structure this year, it was late September. But if we could get a couple more 10 days there, we could focus on bear. Our success rate's fairly good at 7%. You know, the rifle success rate, I think, was 1.8% last year, which is awful. Uh, but I think one of our concerns is in reading the documents, and maybe this will come in BGSS, is it talks about more September rifle seasons. And, you know, we might have conflicts there. We're being told we're growing too fast, and we'd love to see an increased harvest rate with the same number of hunters. But as an organization, we're concerned and want to discuss that continued uh, season structure issue. So that's it for me. I appreciate the time very much. And if there's any questions, I'd entertain those. Mr. Hildy, I think that last point is part of the big game season structure. So yes an open point regardless of what we do today. I guess yes. that's my point. Questions for Mr. Hildy from Commissioner, Commissioner Haskett. Thank you. Um, I want to tell you something, as, like the companion license, I did a little more research on that too, but it's the same answer that we're getting as far as it's a programming issue and it's something that's not going to be easy to do. Yes. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I, I just want to support the membership. And I agree with you. I mean, I live in northeastern Colorado, and I can tell you the guy up in Estes Park who's a new DWM, he's running bear calls constantly. I was told he had to drive down to Durango to get an additional trap this year. And I had heard he, he ran 100 bear calls, or he got 100 phone calls in a week for bear issues. So thank you. Um, Mr. Hildy, just stay there in a sec. Um, yeah. I, I just wanted to, we've gotten a letter from the Colorado Wildlife uh, Federation, and one of the points 
they made was that the fee ought to go to 10 to 20, the maximum, but then there should be a cap per hunter or family. And, and the reason I bring it up is it seems to me like everyone has a particular way of trying to deal with the affordability issue, right? The, and, and I don't know that there's a perfect solution there, but I don't know if commissioners have any thoughts about you know, a cap, I guess, um, is another way of dealing with affordability or whether we don't think uh, that kind of idea makes sense. I think it's worth exploring. This is Commissioner Bray. Yeah, I think it's worth exploring for families. Uh, you just have to study it a little bit, but family of four, cap of some kind of thing, I, I think it's worth studying. I would think that would pro I mean, I don't know if Mr. Hildy's here, but I'm, I mean, sorry, Mr. Chick is here, but I'm assuming that's a big programming issue for us. But I would like to study that concept of a cap, Danielle, for, for the future. I might say the CBA, we had arrived at that cap idea while we were discussing the future generations bill and while it was in the legislature, but we actually changed our positions once uh, pay later became effective and we saw the application increases. So I don't think we're opposed to it, but uh, it changed slightly for us. I think that's for a future year though, so. Very good, thank you, Mr. Hildy. Thank you. Is there, there's no other public comment, is there, on that one? Great. Danielle, I think you're, you're, are you clear here on, on that? I guess the question I have now is, you anticipate we would vote now on the package that we've just gone through, and then we'll move on to the next section? Sure, there's two other chapters that were in this agenda item, but you can split them out. I think we have a solution here, so I kind of like to vote on it, get that behind us, and then we'll move on, unless commissioners have a different view. So with your permission, Mr. Chairman, maybe I can suggest a motion for yes, the please. commission to consider. <laughs> um, so a suggested motion would be that the commission accepts staff's recommendation with the following exceptions, that for the preference point fee, we will require a um, qualifying license to apply as well as charge for a preference point with the fee consistent with the preference point fee proposed by staff. And for bears, we will be charging reducing to $100 for non-residents for the concurrent rifle and PLO licenses and $48 for residents. So Commissioner moved. Haskett. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Haskett. Second, Second. Commissioner Vigil. Uh, Laura, I'd like to have a voice vote on this to give people a chance to say no if they'd like. Roll call. Sorry, roll call vote. Bray? Yes. Burkett, absent. Garcia? Yes. Haskett? Yes. Hauser? McDaniel? Yes. Hepler? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Behill? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. Chairman Howard? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Next item, Daniel, please. So same agenda item, but the next two chapters are W15 and P7, both related to our agent commission rates. Um, so previously, we used table A4 in both of these chapters to annually adjust our license agent commission rates for our non-resident big game license sales with the consumer price index or inflation, at the same time that the non-resident big game license fees were also being adjusted. We were not required to do this by statute, but the agency and the commission always supported doing so. Since the non-resident big game licenses were the only license prices that we could legally adjust in the past, these tables in W15 and P7 mostly focused on those licenses. Second rod stamps, one day and five day fishing, and one day small game commissions were also listed in this table since they were given a higher commission rate above the standard 4.75. But with the passage of the Future Generations Act, all of our license fees can now be annually adjusted with the CPI. And when trying to determine what to do for 2019, now that all our license fees are likely increasing, staff discussed a more straightforward approach to setting our agent commission rates moving forward. 
So staff is proposing instead of adjusting commission rates annually with CPI, instead we put standard percentage rates for commissions um, based on certain categories of licenses. Those would be a 6.7% for our second rod stamps, our one and five day fishing and one day small game licenses. A 3.6% commission for our non-resident big game licenses and 4.75% for all other licenses. Again, these percentages were established by looking at the past co commission percentages um, on the licenses on average. Basically, the goal is to make a more standardized commission percentage rate while also ensuring that our license agents make slightly more money than they made the previous year as long as CPI goes up. One percentage rate for all license sales didn't seem feasible, but this three category approach seemed comparable to the rate structure we currently pay. The main benefit to this approach is that the commission rates only need to be put into regulation and into IPAWS once as they do not need to be adjusted every year. As the license fees are adjusted annually with CPI concurrently, the commission rates would also adjust if it was a set percentage rate. So those were the only uh, proposed changes to W15 and P7 and we have heard support for this recommended change from our license agents. Any comments or questions? Yes, please. I'll make a motion to um, approve the recommendation as presented by staff. Public comment. <laughs> we don't have any public comment from Blue Slips. Does anybody in the public want to come forward? Seeing none. Thank you, Council. Okay, we have a second from Commissioner McDaniel. I think we'll do this one by voice vote, unless there's any objection? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So that passes unanimously, Laura. Thank you. All right. We should move fairly quickly from here. Take that um, as a promise. <laughs> the next uh, agenda item number 11 is final W1 fishing regulations, which are green in color, and this is an action item for the commission. Um, the Commission heard all the proposed modifications to our fishing regulations back in September. The only addition since September is for Valco Ponds number 7, which is on page 51. Um, the Valco Ponds are a series of gravel pits that have been filled with water and are now owned and managed by CPW as a part of Lake Pueblo State Park. Some of the ponds have been leased and stocked by CPW with fish dating back to 1996. Currently, ponds five through seven are not open to public fishing, and pond number four is only partially open to fishing. With the recent passing of the landowner, CPW has gained full ownership of all seven of these Valco ponds. CPW intends to open pond number four to the public by the end of this year, and to open the other three within a year. Valco ponds receives moderate fishing pressure, which varies by pond. In the absence of public access, pond number seven has grown some very large catfish and largemouth bass, and the resource is capable of producing some trophy-sized fish. Since ponds number five through seven have not been stocked since 2011 and are not open to public for fishing, they have benefited from little to no harvest and have relied solely on natural reproduction to sustain the fishery. Therefore, there are very few small fish in the system, and the fishery is comprised of mostly large, older fish. So therefore, staff is proposing a restrictive harvest regulation on Valco Pond number seven to provide a trophy angling opportunity and allow biologists to reestablish younger year classes of sport fish while rebuilding the adequate forage base. CPW aquatic biologists would like to continue to allow harvest on ponds number one through six and develop pond number seven into a destination trophy bass and channel catfish water. As a reminder, the other proposed changes include modifying the Chatfield and Cherry Creek Walleye Dam Spawn Enclosure regulations on pages 10 through 11, establishing catch and release regulations for dry gulch, which is on page 16, several changes for Pueblo Reservoir, including modifying the walleye spawn closure, implementing a special regulation for crappie, and a new wiper regulation for Pueblo as well. Those are all on page 38. We're also proposing to extend the special regulations on the Rio Grande River for the entire stretch, which is on page 40, and establishing special regulations for Upper Seepage Lake near Creed, which is on page 51. I'm happy to cover any of those other changes in more detail if so desired by the commission, but otherwise those are all the final W1 fishing regulations. 
I had to present, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, any comments or questions? Daniel, I had just a short question. I just It's a little public relations. I know, I think I got contacted by the Walleye Foundation at one point, and that seemed to just be about communicating better. Um, and if I read the public comment correct, I think that relationship has been addressed. Is, can you confirm that for me? Yeah, I believe our staff reached out to that group after that public comment was received and have worked with them to resolve those issues. Yeah, they, they contacted me directly. That's why I raise it. So thank you. Um, I think we could use a motion on this one as well. Oh, public comment. Thank you. <laughs> why, why don't we get the motion the second, and then I'll take public comment on the motion. So. I'll move. Thank you, Commissioner Zimmerman. Need a second. second. Second from Commissioner McDaniel. Public comment on our motion here? Seeing none, we'll do this one by voice vote as well. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, next is agenda item number 12, which is final regulations for Turkey in Chapter W3, including 2019 season dates and quotas. So this is an action item up for your final approval. It's yellow in color on your devices. In this chapter, you'll see the reduced price of $80 for non-resident fur bear licenses on page one, which was done to stay consistent with our non-resident small game license price in Chapter W0. Again, you'll also see the $7 resident and $9 non-resident application fee prices as well, and changing the application deadline to 8 p.m. instead of midnight for turkey applications. The application date is also proposed to be moved to the first Tuesday of the month instead of the second Tuesday of the month for 2019. Season dates have been updated for both the spring and fall 2019 seasons, and quotas for 2019 have also been adjusted with some increases in a few units. Overall, the quota went from 1665 to 1885 in the spring season and from 785 to 845 for the fall season. I do have two minor floor changes to present to the commission. Um, one of the season dates for TE444L1R, the, the closing date was not modified for 2018, so that's just a minor floor change. That closing date should be 10-6-2019. And also, the quota for hunt code TM02301R should actually be 15 and not 10. So a further increase of five more licenses for that hunt code. Those are all the final proposed turkey changes I had for Chapter W3, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Daniel. I'm sorry, I was just looking at <laughs> Commissioner Hauser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, I'm just curious about the time change from midnight to eight. Just Clarity, I don't know what the rationale for that was. Sure, the, the thought behind that was we would have more staff and vendor resources available since a lot of people procrastinate and wait till the last minute to apply that we would have adequate staff available to answer those questions. Thank you, Daniel. This is an action item, commissioners. So moved. Mr. McDaniel is moved. Second. Second from Commissioner Hauser. We'll do the, any uh, public comment. I don't have any on a blue slip. Seeing none, we'll do this by voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously, Laura. Thank you. Let's keep going, Daniel. Sure. Agenda item number 13 is next, which is final chapters P1, W9, and W16, all related to liquor law changes. This is an action item for you today. We are one-stepping these regulatory changes so that we could have these effective by January 1. Previously, based on state statute 1247-901, the consumption of alcoholic beverages with a content of alcohol greater than 3.2% on public lands was prohibited. But with the passage of Senate Bill 18243, individuals who are at least 21 years of age or older can now consume all types of liquor on public lands, including our state parks, state wildlife areas, and division lease state trust lands, as long as such consumption has been approved by rule of the Parks and Wildlife Commission. Without adoption of any rule by the Commission, the consumption of alcohol, including 3-2 beer, on division properties would be prohibited starting January 1, 2019 thus the need to one-step these final regulations today. 
These staff proposed regulations would allow such alcohol consumption, but establishes necessary restrictions on that consumption, as well as dispensing and retail in order to protect our public safety and the enjoyment of all of our users of these properties. So the provided restrictions are as follows. The consumption of alcohol would not be allowed on any archery or firearm range unless specifically approved on a concession contract, a special activities permit, or a cooperative agreement. There would be no selling or dispensing of alcohol unless otherwise approved by a concession contract, special activities, or cooperative agreement. And individuals would not be allowed to be drunk or under the influence of any controlled substance on a CPW property in a manner that endangers oneself or others, damages property or resources, or interferes with the enjoyment of other visitors. You will see identical regulations in both chapters P1 for parks on page 5, as well as in W9 on pages 25 and through 28 for state wildlife areas, and division lease state trust lands. All other property-specific regulations pertaining to alcohol have also been removed throughout both chapters. Furthermore, in regulations in chapter W16 on page 34, gives the regional manager authority to close the property entirely to alcohol consumption when such closure is necessary to protect health and human safety or protect resources. Those are all the proposed alcohol consumption related regulatory changes for chapters P1, W9, and W16, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Daniel. Any comments or questions? Commissioner Garcia. I'm just curious. I assume the AGs must have jumped in on this one to help. Uh, the DUI part, it's not a strict liability. You have to go to this extra step to prove that they are somehow dangering me or somebody else or whatever. Is, is that true? In terms of the level of impairment? No, just in terms of it's not a strict liability. A person can be drunk as long as they don't violate then part two, which is that you would then have to have evidence that they endangered me or somebody else, or, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Council. Any other questions or comments? D Daniel, I have one. I cannot, in my own mind, come up with a scenario in which somebody should be selling alcohol at a gun range. So I'm, I'm curious about that one. Am I missing something there? Because I, I just think if you're at a gun range, there shouldn't be any alcohol sales. So. I think staff was thinking mostly about Cameo and how even after the shooting range is closed for the day, if there was a special event, making sure it was clear that the division would approve these on a case-by-case -case basis, and perhaps we would want to allow a special event at Cameo after hours and allow them to sell liquor. So does that, is, so in other words, the regulation as it's currently drafted would not allow alcohol sales on a gun range unless someone in management has okayed it. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Very good, this is another action item, I believe, so I can use a motion. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Taylor. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Hauser. Let's look on the other side. So I need a second. Yeah. Commissioner V. Hill. Um, any public comment? I don't think we have a blue slip. Um, good. Very good. Then we'll call for, uh, we'll do the same thing, a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Let's keep going, Daniel. Um, the next agenda item number 14 is final regulations for chapter P7 to implement future generation changes on the park side. Um, this agenda item is green in color and is also an action item for your final consideration. So with the passage of the Hunting, Fishing, and Parks for Future Generations Act, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission now has the authority to raise park pass fees by a dollar for annual passes for the dailies and $10 per year for the annual park passes. And all of our other park product fees can now be adjusted now that our statutory revenue cap has been removed. State park fees were last increased for camping in 2015 and in 2010 for our daily and annual passes. Therefore, increases in both categories are timely and appropriate. So our specific recommendations for 2019 include, on page six, raising the individual passes from three to four dollars. Staff is also proposing to add 15 new state parks to the list that now require an individual pass, including all the parks in the Northwest region. 
Again, these are the passes that are required by every individual entering a park outside of a motor vehicle. We're also proposing special activity fees per person be raised from two to four dollars, which is on page nine. Having our affixed annual passes go up $10 to $80, which is on page 11. Our Aspen Leaf annuals would also go up $10 to $70. And our affixed multiples would be going up to $40 each. They were previously $35. Daily passes are also going up the $1 maximum to $8. And then on page 12, you'll see our camping, yurt, cabin, and event facility fees are also proposed to be raised between $13 and $8 a night, with the price proposed in regulation being the highest price that the agency could charge for these permits. On page 27, you'll see that these camping fees can be reduced by up to 50% year-round by the regional manager, either seasonally or by day of the week, to help increase occupancy or remain competitively priced with nearby amenities. So the proposed maximum prices for camping would be $41 a night for our full hookup sites, $36 a night for our electric sites, $28 a night for our basic sites, and $18 a night for our primitive camping sites. Cabins and yurts also went up $10 per night except at Mueller State Park. We're also proposing to no longer charge a reservation fee of $10 and instead to incorporate this fee into our base camping fee to improve customer service. On page 15, you'll see group picnic areas have been proposed to raise from $90 to $150 for deluxe sites, from $60 to $100 for improved sites, and from $30 to $50 for base, basic sites. And the reason for this dramatic increase on these fees is based on current demand and the fact that many of our parks don't have special event facilities and use these type of structures for those events. Then on page 16, you'll see we're proposing that our dog off-leash permits at Chatfield and Cherry Creek go up $5 for the annual price pass to $25 and up $1 for the daily dog off-leash area pass to $3. We're also proposing a new state park hang tag pass pilot project, which you'll see in the beginning of the chapter on pages 1 through 3. Based on public comments that we received during our strategic plan in 2015, Park visitors have long been asking for a non-affixed annual pass. CPW also heard this feedback from various legislators um, during the past few legislative sessions. With iPods now live, we have the capability to expand the type of pass sales and thereby offering more flexibility to the public. So the state park's annual hang tag pass would be sold for $120 at any of our current license sale outlets. The printed pass would then be inserted into a hang tag provided by a CPW and hung from the rearview mirror to enter a park. A higher replacement fee of $60, or 50% of the original cost, is being proposed for this pass type due to the fact that it can be transferred or lost. The 120 price was selected based on the price of an affixed plus a multiple. This pass type, however, also has the added benefit that it can be used on any vehicle as long as the owner is an occupant in that vehicle but only one vehicle can use the pass at a time. Creating a pilot program for the hang tag pass at a higher price point also allows us to bolster revenues with appropriate marketing efforts. All the other previous affixed and annual park passes will continue to be sold, and the pilot will be evaluated after a year to help determine what pass types the division should continue to sell long term. Those are all the proposed final changes to chapter P7, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Daniel. Commissioners, any comments or questions? This, is, this one has been a long time coming, I think. Hang tag. Commissioner Hauser. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just give a huge thumbs up. Um, as Director Broshide remembers, one of my first experiences was trying to buy a pass, and I thought it has to go with the car. Um, so one, thank you for that. Um, second, I, I, I presume that uh, some comparison to a national parks pass was looked, was examined, which is less than 120 and is also a transferable pass. So just curious about the comparison between those and sort of, I don't know whether it was number of parks or, but that's a transferable pass as well. So just curious how that was factored in. So as far as the pricing structure, we, there was some folks on staff that proposed a slightly lower fee, but the committee that examined this issue felt confident that 120 was a good price because it was the price of a 
one a fix plus a multiple, so your current two vehicle price that we charge, plus it had an added benefit that it could be used if you wanted to go with a friend into the state parks, you could use it on additional vehicles beyond those two. So we felt like the 120 was an appropriate price, at least to start for our first pilot year. Um, we did look at the national parks as far as the design for the hang tag, and we're doing a similar product design for our hang tag pass. Is that enough, Commissioner Hauser? Yeah, I'm just I'm just finding it here. This, um, so 80, 80 for a national parks pass, um, which is transferable. Um, with, I think it's within a family. Um, I don't know. I I don't have any basis for knowing sort of what the comparison is, but I, I just would say that that it, it seems it seems high to me for a transferable pass. So not to throw a monkey in the in the mix right now. Um, just just for point of comparison. I, and I don't know, you know, where other state passes, how does this compare with other state parks passes? You know, are they transferable? What are those rates? Just if you can give us some idea. I don't Mr. Know Taylor, I think you had a comment too. Thank you, Chairman. I, yeah, similarly to Commissioner Hauser's question, I, I too am curious about the, the, the analysis that was done to come to the conclusion of these proposed changes. Um, was it as much market, market research and marketplace pricing similar to, uh, to federal parks passes, but also um, the, does that address the need for the, the revenue miss that's happening in most of the parks right now, understanding that most of them run in the red? So does, the, does this achieve a more solvent parks budget? So the work group that was assigned to working on this issue primarily was park managers and some members of the leadership team, as well as myself. And what we actually started off as our base was a calculator of some of these costs that we need to make up on the park side so that we're not in the red. And so we actually started from there and then discussed based on demand and what we think customers would be willing to pay. And we kind of worked from there to help establish these price recommendations. And Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Director. And I think it's important to understand too is that um, the parks or state parks are managed as a system of parks and not on the individual. The park earns what and they spend what they earn. Um, that we have uh, major parks that generate a lot of revenue, and that revenue spread out through the system. So it, it's just to remind the, the commissioners is that um, that's how we're we're managing them all combined together like Chatfield, Pueblo, Jerry Creek, generate significant income that then is spread out to the rest of the, of the 38 state parks around just to keep them, keep them going. But yeah, the goal is absolutely treat them, if we could, is treat them as, um, as uh, individual parks that could be self-sufficient. That's kind of the goal. But um, just until we break through to that, the second is, is that this hang pass is, is a short step on a rock cross in the stream to get to this, that passes and permits and uh, what Commissioner Zimmerman uh, mentioned earlier about hunting and fishing is getting it away from the fix to the vehicle to a hang pass that's transferable to individuals now have, have that. And now it's gonna allow us to track trail use, track, uh, I tell the story that as, as I'm riding my bike, I, I got, I won't say accosted, but questioned by somebody else who was there and said, you know, where's your state park pass? I said, well, it's affixed to my vehicle. And so I think it's going to let us know now who's going into parks. We have that, uh, we have the scan codes or whatever that's going to be. So this is just a temporary, but our ultimate goal is to get to that. And then we'll put a chip. Uh, Madeline West. Thank you. I just want to maybe make a finer point to what Director Bursch had just said because I, as I understand it now, my annual pass that was taped to my car just expired and I went to get a new one and it's really just a piece of paper that I'm supposed to tape to my windshield, which actually makes it really easy for me to transfer it to my other vehicles without, you know, buying anything more. So it, I would just encourage the commission when you look at this 
hang tag program as a pilot to just consider the other factors in determining the success of the hang tag and not, you know, see that maybe people didn't purchase the transferable hang tag because there was another way around no. getting a transferable pass um, and really keep that future, Sorry. that future goal in mind um, to, you know, make it tied to a person and put it on their phone and make it really easy to avoid fraudulent activities that I promise I will not do myself. I will buy a hang tag <laughs> officially, even though I could just use scotch tape. Yeah, because you're losing your immunity now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Did I have that before? <laughs> she just doesn't like taping the thing to her windshield. <laughs> Commissioner Taylor. I also just would like to clarify. So the, the cost for the affixed vehicle pass is now $80, and then the cost for the hang tag pass proposed is $120. So we're we're inferring that the cost of the sleeve itself might be $40, is that? So right now you can buy a multiple, which is a second vehicle. So if you own an annual pass, you can get a discount on a second vehicle, a fixed pass for $40. So that's where we got the, the two prices. So it would continue to cover two vehicles plus any other vehicle you ride in. Commissioner Hauser and Commissioner Taylor, I mean, you've heard us on the wildlife side modifying staff's recommendations. So if you, if you would like to do that, you, now would be the moment. Um, Chairman, I, you know, I'm doing this on the fly, Chairman Howard. Um, quick use of Google, um, Google search, uh, Utah 75, um, Arizona is a $75 annual pass. So, and again, I'm not, this is not precise because I'm just trying to do it as we go. So it doesn't mean we have to sort of keep up with the Joneses or they keep up with us, but it would be helpful to know that we're sort of within market or particularly our neighboring states. And again, just affordability. And we, we talked about this for family passes, you know, family, you know, cap for, you know, hunting licenses and others. So we we'll just open it up for maybe some more discussion. Very good. And I see at the podium, Margaret Taylor. Hello, everyone. I just magically appeared. Um, Margaret Taylor, Assistant Director for Capital Parks and Trails. I just want to add a couple um, discussion points to this discussion. Um, number one is that we did do a review, and we do a review of other states and what they charge. The trick is that not every state is equal. Um, every state has a different funding method. Um, some, some states don't require parks passes. Some states require you to have a registration for vehicles. So it is hard for us to compare states to states. Um, what I would say is that also keep in mind that some states receive general fund funding, which we do not. And one of the reasons why we need to raise these fees is to support the system. And as Danielle mentioned, when we were looking at raising these fees, um, we looked at the amount that we needed, which was around $5 million, um, and looked at the, the fee structure and uh, tried to increase fees, fees so we could cover um, that gap that we have. So when, when we're raising fees, it's not necessarily for the actual pass. Um, it is so that we can sustain the system. Um, and what I would add with, um, as far as national parks, it is a, a bit hard to compare the two. And the reason is because um, there really isn't that many national parks in Colorado. We do have more than a lot of states do. But national parks are not something that visitors would um, visit every day. Not to say that there aren't some that do that, but um, the demographic that's visiting national parks um, really is that, that traveler that has planned a vacation, et cetera, et cetera. What Colorado State Parks afford are 41 different state parks all around the state that you can visit um, a lot. And we have some visitors that literally come to parks every single day. And so when we're talking about a value or a price putting on um, what, what we charge within Colorado, we have to imagine that um, our visitors are going to have quite a few more visits than, um, than the uh, visitors to a national park from that state. Most of the people that buy our annual pass are in-state users, if that makes sense, and if that adds anything to the conversation. 
Commissioner Garcia, you might want to talk about the Laffer curve now, I would think, right? <laughs> no. No, um, but I, I assume somebody has looked to determine whether or not we're going to lose sufficient buyers by raising the fee. They will still have the choice to buy the regular affixed and a multiple if they choose that they don't want to buy the hang tag. Or a day pass. Correct. Commissioner Bray. If I understand it right, the hang tag is the exact same price of, as a multiple vehicle price. Uh, annual and a multiple, yeah. Annual and multiple. Mm -hmm. Director. The hang tag potentially go between three and four vehicles versus the other is just two. Chairman, that was going to be my point that <laughs> Commissioner Bray made is there's, there's the value is that, I mean, you could even talk about, I could, I could have a hang pass for my car, I could transfer it to any of my cars, I could ride with Commissioner Hauser in her car and paying it. It's when the pass is affixed to the person or associated with a person and not the vehicle. So if you think about the value of being able to transfer that, now that's where that 120 comes in because I would have to buy an annual for my car, an annual for my wife's, and, and there's, the, there's the difference. It's, it's the value that you're getting of, of being able to, to transfer that among party as long as I am there or there's, as long as I am there. And that's where the, that's where the value is that comes in, the cost. Uh, commissioners, I'm running out of time, so there's two things we can do here. One is we can continue discussions, and I'll make time after lunch um, to do that, or we could move ahead with a motion. And then I have, we have recognition, which is you know, very important, and I want to get to that before lunch. So it's either vote now, or we'll take it up after lunch. Um, so, so I'll move this item uh, uh, with the assumption and understanding that, like we do with all other fees, um, that we'll look at it closely after a year, since this is the first year, um, and ask staff to bring back an analysis of um, sort of other states' comparisons, um, use, um, you know, whatever kind of analysis we can look at a year from now, so that if we need to make any adjustments at that time, um, that we're sort of on record for um, committing to do that. Do I have a second? Second from Commissioner Vigil. Any uh, public comment? Uh, very good, then we'll do this one by voice vote. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Danielle. Mr. Prinslow, I think you're up with awards and recognition. Just the way the national task force. Just the way the national task force. I carry it. Chairman, director, commissioners, uh, Dan Prenzel, Southeast Regional Manager, and uh, uh, welcome to the Southeast Region, Burlington, Colorado. Um, I'd like to make a couple recognitions before lunch. Thank you to the chairman for this opportunity. If I could have uh, uh, my wonderful volunteer coordinator, Jenna Sanchez, come up, and I'd also like to have our special volunteer, Joe uh, Crodelt, come up. He doesn't know he's being asked up here. He thinks he's observing the commission proceeding. So he's confused what happened the last couple hours, but he's, uh, we're at least going to recognize him for it. <laughs> all, all reason. Um, again, uh, Jen, I will say Jenna. Thanks to Jenna and uh, uh, Southeast staff, but really thanks to Joe for all he does for Parks and Wildlife. So I'll read a couple things uh, about it. So, so Joe has been volunteering for the state of Colorado since 1992. Joe started helping uh, wildlife officers then with the Colorado Division of Wildlife and now proudly helps Colorado Parks and Wildlife on a variety of projects, 26 years of volunteering. Joe acts in a lead volunteer role and the main point of contact for Area 14, which is Frank McGee's area from uh, uh, Woodland Park divide to Burlington or Kansas. It's a long, long, fairly narrow strip. Um, 
on on bear calls in mostly Teller counties where where Joe lives. Uh, excuse me, Joe um, <laughs> gives out information to hundreds of residents and guests in Teller County annually, but he also follows up, follows up and helps with home inspections to point out specific attractants to remove to help keep bears wild and people safe uh, in Teller County and El Paso County and keep them from breaking in or causing uh, agricultural damage. Joe has a proven track record as having a positive impact on homeowners and landowners. Uh, Joe has also helped wildlife officers and field biologists gather bighorn sheep data on the top of Pikes Peak for many years on the annual counts that we do on, the, on Pikes Peak. Joe reaches hundreds of people each year in creative and meaningful ways. I'll give you a quote from the local wildlife officer, uh, uh, Tim Craning. Mr. Uh, Crodell goes above and beyond the call of bear aware duty by scheduling and meeting with various HOAs in the community where he presents programs on bears, lions, moose, and how to live with them. He also presents at local school, local schools where he reaches the youth in Teller County with key bear messages. He has certainly made a positive impact in the community that he lives. Joe is also present at the CPW trainings and he adds quality to our projects by giving a historical perspective, kind of like me, getting, getting older, uh, uh, years of helping the agency. The Southeast region is proud to have such a high caliber, long time volunteer with a passion for the resource and for helping CPW and recognizes Joe for his many designated, de excuse me, dedicated years of service. So with that, Joe, thank you very much. Here is a plaque. This is a Colorado Parks and Wildlife recognizes Joe Crawdell for 30 years of dedicated volunteer service to the state of Colorado, signed Director Broshot. So All right. Thanks to the director and the commission. Um, just want to say I'm proud to be a volunteer and a supporter of Parks and Wildlife, formerly Division of Wildlife. Took me a while to make that transition. Um, <laughs> and I uh, love being able to help people learn to live with their wildlife resources here in Colorado. Thank, Thank you, you, Joe. All right, and secondly, you won't have to listen to me very long, but um, in a, a little, still an honor of life, but more somber moment, um, I'm going to ask Frank McGee to come up. We would like to recognize uh, our uh, past employee, Dave Nichols, and his family. He passed. He was our property technician out here at Bonnie Reservoir uh, for years and years. He worked for the agency for 28 years before his passing. And so uh, here in the audience, if they would come forward, I'd appreciate it would be Mary Nichols, Dave's wife, uh, Mike Nichols, his brother, Carl, his brother-in-law, Jill, his sister, David, his brother-in-law, and Rob, uh, his brother. So with that, I'll pass it over to uh, Frank. And just really want to appreciate the Nichols. Dave did a fantastic job. So with that, I'll give it to Frank. Uh, <laughs> Director, Commissioners, Chairman Howard, thanks for having us. Um, trying to keep it together here. Um, Dave was part of um, previously the Division of Wildlife and now CPW's family for a very long time. And um, you know, last year I had the sad um, duty to you know, tell everyone um, in the agency that he had passed. And um, I just wanted, you know, this agency is very much a family, and it was important for me to come to you and tell you about Dave and all the amazing work that Dave did and that Dave's family did. Um, you know, Dave worked on our properties for decades, and Mary and um, Dave and Mary's children spent many, many hours, not just Dave, but um, everybody was involved in working on those properties and keeping them 
to the very highest standard. And it was important for me to come to you and to recognize the work that Dave did and um, Dave's family in this setting so that we could help remember Dave and also to let Dave's family know that we, can, we still consider them part of our CPW family. Um, so with that, um, I've got a little plaque here for Dave's family and um, just wanted to recognize him uh, with you here today and thank you very much for the opportunity to do that. say on behalf of Mary and our, our entire family that Dave loved his work. Uh, he loved his time doing what he did. We're happy that you allowed him to do it and we're very happy uh, for the honor you're giving uh, Dave today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. We'll adjourn for lunch. And we'll be back on time at, uh, I believe that's 1.30.
for sheep, goat, and moose residents, and $100 for all non-resident preference points except for bear. And then changing the recommended pricing discount um, for the concurrent rifle bear licenses and PLO bear licenses to $100 for non-residents and $48 for residents. So, commissioners, I think it's the interplay between the qualifying license that we're now requiring of everyone to be, participate in the draw and then a preference point fee. And here, I think the point is, if you're unsuccessful in the draw, currently, you get a point. What the sportsman's community, sportswomen's community is, is interpreting is we're now saying if you're unsuccessful in the draw, you must pay, for example, for elk, what, $40 for that point? And I just want to make certain that's our intent. That is an enormous change that, to me at least, that preference point, you're unsuccessful, and now you're paying. And you're paying also, you know, not $10, but $40 per animal. So I don't know, Commissioner McDaniel or Commissioner Bray, if you might want to give some thoughts on that. That was not my, that was not what I was thinking. <laughs> Where I get a little confused is our intent, I think, our intention was you buy that qualifying license up front, and I don't know exactly how that's going to work, but that'd be a fishing license or a small game or whatever it may be. Uh, but as I think about that, you, you know, there's a ton of sportsmen, and I've played that game myself. You apply for, for example, a four-season buck tag knowingly you're not going to get it, but you get your preference point. So I don't think that is what we want to continue to happen either. I, it's my understanding that, uh, yes, the, as I think about it, the, the preference point fee would take place if, if is that yours, uh, Marvin? Mr. McDaniel. Well, my first intention was, um, <clears throat> or thought, was this idea about the, having the qualified license. Have to buy a license to participate in the draw. It's really standard fare here in the West. Uh, it really makes a difference to us and our agency in terms of matching dollars. So I think that's really critical to implement. Um, to be honest with you, I hadn't really connected the whole preference point and how much it would be, and that kind of got lumped in with it. 
Um, it does relate to my comment I did make, though, that we are kicking a can down the road um, without some modification or ideas around the preference point. We can choose not to do that, not implement a preference point fee um, if you're unsuccessful in drawing points. Will we get fewer applications from having to buy a license? I don't, I don't know. I don't, maybe um, Danielle or somebody could tell us what they think the market data would indicate to us with regards to our demand for our products or the products of the state. Um, it would make us look like other states, not charging a preference point. And it will probably go back to we're stacking up a lot of points and it's going to be a lottery pick to get a moose tag. Already is. Uh, to do exactly that. I would personally support um, what we did, which was requiring a qualified license. Um, I'm not quite sure what the preference point fee should be for, for, for having one. There's a few states that do charge incrementally for a preference point, and about, I'll tell you, probably three quarter that do not. That at least I'm familiar with. So I, I kind of like the idea. I mean, people say pay to play. Well, this is pay to play. You want to play the game with preference points, you pay. Um, and it would definitely have an effect on the number of licenses or applications that are, are submitted, in my mind anyway. So I'm just rambling now, John. No, no, it's all very helpful. Commissioner Haskett? Do yeah, you have a comment. On I agree with both Commissioner Bray and McDaniel. You can't have it both ways, and that's the problem, is people are complaining that we're not doing something about preference points, and then if we're going to do something, they're going to complain because they have to pay. There's no simple answer, but I, I think we have to do something to prevent the increase that we saw this last year and, um, and also encourage people to use their preference points, which I think this will do also. Commissioner Zimmerman. Um, sorry, I maybe I lost a little, I, I'm just a little confused searching for a little clarity. So how is what we're discussing, can we go back to staff recommendation? I mean, how far? I was actually going to suggest okay. that. Why don't we do that, Daniel? Just tell us what the staff recommendation, just on the preference point, everyone agrees on the qualifying license, and then we'll just compare it to what you know, we just talked about. So a staff's recommendation, if you held a qualifying license, there would be no fee for preference points. But if you didn't hold a qualifying license, if you're applying for elk, deer, or pronghorn, the, the fee would be $40 for a preference point for each of those species for residents, and $50 fee for sheep, goat, and moose, each of those species for applicants, and then a $100 application fee for all non-residents if they didn't hold a qualifying license. So we're still trying to incentivize them to buy a qualifying license by where we set those fees at for the preference point. We're trying to incentivize them to buy the license, overpaying the fee, but we wouldn't be charging them both for a base license and for a preference point. Commissioner Zimmerman. And so currently, everyone just has to buy. If you want a point, you have to buy a license. Is that? True. You can I mean, apply for a preference point only hunt code, and then you just pay the application fee currently. No license. And, and so our concern is that because there's no license, we're not getting the federal funding? Correct. We can't count them as a hunter or angler without the license purchase. And so we're, we're looking for a, a way to, okay. John, uh, can, can you just Garcia. help me with why you interjected the successful versus unsuccessful? If you're currently <laughs> unsuccessful in a draw, then you get a point. Right. And so what we're proposing now is that no, you wouldn't automatically get a point. You'd have to pay another fee to get that point. Okay. That's and that, and that is quite, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that is a much more dramatic change, I think, than saying you've got to buy a qualifying license. Right. Right. And as I understand the qualifying license, what we did later in the morning was fishing, combo, small game, and turkey. Right. Those are the common, those are the qualifying licenses? So currently the qualifying licenses are a big game license from the previous year or the current year, or an annual small game combo or fishing from the current year. So that would have to change a little bit if we're just looking at the current year as well. Right, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a current year qualifying license that is fishing, combo, small game, another big game license, uh, or a turkey license. Correct. Is it an... Commissioner Haskett. Thank you. Is it another big game license? Is that part of it? Or is it just fishing, small game? If we're doing it at the time of the draw, they wouldn't have been able to buy another big game license okay. to qualify with. Okay. So it's just the four current licenses that you could hold, which would be fishing, small game, combo, and turkey. Those are the qualifying licenses. Okay. John, and that Garcia. was my understanding of the one of the concerns with the iPod, but with the power we're going to do this, yep. is that for the people that have the fishing small game combo, they would have their license at the time because you buy it in the spring. But for the big game, you would have to do it on last year's license to be able to do it now. And I think we dropped that as an option because we went to straight current year, right? Correct. That was the motion, yeah. And they wouldn't have it yet. Right. So we'll get the small game license or fishing or turkey. Director, you want to say something? Just, a, just one thing to consider, Chairman, is when you are successful as a non-resident, um, you get a non-resident fishing license along with yours. So if you require a, I would, I would propose you make it a hunting license um, because what will happen is we'd have to refund people's fishing licenses if they're successful in the draw. So if, if fishing is the qualifying license, they get drawn, they will get their, their license plus a non-resident fishing, we'll have to reimburse for one of those. So I would probably leave it as a qualifying license, be a hunting license. Then it's also the, the excise tax will be credited to Pittman-Robertson side, the hunting side, the wildlife side versus the fishing. So any discussion on that point? Commissioner Bray. Well, yeah, that, that point is valid. This proposal, quite frankly, is more of a proposal to address preference point creep than anything else. And it's a fee generator. There's no question it'll, it'll generate some fees. But if we want to get serious about preference points, this is one step to do it. And perhaps the preference point fee, maybe to start with, we set it way too high. Maybe it needs to be a simple fee, 10 or 20 bucks. I don't know. But something. I still think it could be something to in, start the ball toward, toward that uh, preference point. Mm -hmm. Plus, it'll raise some, it, it's a change, and maybe it doesn't need to be such a dramatic change at once as far as the cost, but I think it's a pretty good idea myself. Commissioner Haskett. I think it's a good idea, too. There are also companies out there that apply for people, um, that apply for preference points, and that's one of our problems. There's a lot of people, I don't know what you pay, I've never done it, never looked at it, but I know there are companies, and you can just say, I want to apply for points, and... Colorado, Arizona, Utah, wherever, and they do it. And whether or not those people ever hunt, I don't know, but it doesn't help us. Let me just ask, since we're re-raising this, if there's any, do we have any public comment from anyone? Mr. Hildy. Sorry. Oh, and Mr. Gates, too. Okay. Chairman Howard, commissioners, thanks very much. As you consider this, you know, one thing that I might point out is taking, again, a species-specific approach. I don't think we really have a point creep issue with pronghorn. I don't think we really have a point creep issue with deer because it's totally limited. There are some high-demand units, but it's not like elk, sheep, moose, or goat. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Hildy, so are you suggesting, for example, on the big three, moose, sheep, uh, and goat? Our recent survey showed member support in our organization for paying a preference point fee, definitely for sheep, moose, and goat. I don't think we asked about pronghorn or deer. Um, it's one way to solve it. Um, you know, my personal opinion, you can spend a lot of money over a lot of years not to draw a license. But. John, I had a question for Steve. Sure. I Commissioner tried to Garcia. find you during lunch, but you were gone. Uh, 
You mentioned that I thought you were concerned about the having to have a license, uh, to qualify a license. Yes. People from your organization all have the qualifying license. Yeah, I don't anticipate any of our members would uh, be affected in a pay-to-play okay. scenario. Okay. We participate in the system regularly okay. and annually. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Chairman, Directors, Commissioners. Uh, just, just one scenario to maybe consider is I don't think anybody should be penalized for applying for a legitimate license. In a scenario that I was just explaining to Mr. Chick, is some areas that might take zero to one point or one to two points when an individual or a group turns around and applies for that, some people in that category would be able to draw a license with zero to one or one to two. The other ones that didn't draw would still have the zero to one opportunity or the one to two opportunity, they would be penalized for not drawing when other individuals in that same category would be rewarded for applying. Uh, I don't think that's quite fair and that was the intent of what the commission had originally discussed. If somebody has 20 points that requires for an area and the guy's putting in for one with one point or two points, there's, there's no chance in hell that he's going to draw that. Uh, that could be construed as, you know, adding to the to the equation of getting into the system and not getting any benefit back out of it. That doesn't contribute to the point creep side of it unless he continually is trying to build it up. But somebody that is actually applying and trying to get in on a group level or an individual level with zero to one or one to two and two to three or whatever has a legitimate opportunity to get into that, you're taking that away and you're penalizing them for participating, legitimate attempting to participate since they've already had a qualifying license in other categories anyway. So, I mean, I know it's complex and it needs to be probably re-looked at at some point, but legitimate people that are trying to draw within the parameters of the requirements and the requirements or the, the minimum amount of preference points available, I don't believe and I don't think most sportsmen would believe that they should be penalized for doing something just because their name didn't get picked uh, into the process when they were legitimately had another chance to get picked like some of the other people in that category. Thank you. Dan, did you have something else you wanted to? Not at this point. I'll address it at somewhere okay. else. You guys will get tired of me today, so. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Dan. Um, so, Commissioners, I'm not certain where that takes us other than it illuminates, I think, that the motion does, in fact, mean that if you have a qualifying license, you apply, you're unsuccessful, you don't get a point, you have to pay for that point. Mm -hmm. And is that what we want to do, and do we want to do it at this level? And do we want to do it for all species or just some species? Is it possible for us to hear from JT or Dean or Mark or? Let's hear from uh, Mr. Prinslow, since he bent my ear at one point. <laughs> that we were being controversial. For the sake of my career, but I, <clears throat> I'm old enough and close enough to retirement, I'll just tread in these turban waters so, chairman director and commissioners so <clears throat> the and i think you've covered post most of this but the intent of staff's lengthy lengthy discussions was to spend time on the pay to play that's different than obviously a preference point and the pay to play's intent was i'll pick on a state if you're in georgia or in colorado but you're in georgia and you don't buy a hunting or fishing license, you're not participating in the North American model. And the pay to play, the intent of that is to charge them significantly for sitting out and just chirping into our system once a year for a preference point. That's the intent of pay to play. Hell, it happens at resident or non-resident level. And so the intent of the staff recommendation was to increase that fee to make it more difficult for the people that don't play year to year, hence Mr. Hildes. But by, <clears throat> but by what happened earlier, you took pay to play as a preference point fee. So that's, I would say, kind of problem one. It's a, it's, it was apples and oranges. If you, it, it was intent was if somebody didn't have a license at all. And so if people apply, that's why a, call, a qualifying license matters only in pay to play, not in really a preference point fee. 
today, hunters apply, their application fee went up, their license fee is going to go up. There will be some people that will already say, as sportsmen, saying, oh, well, that's, that's a pretty big change. And, and what earlier happened then is, oh, by the way, no matter if you draw a license or not, we're going to charge you a preference point fee. And that is, there's really been no substantive discussion with sportsmen in the state or out of state about that. It's been listed as a five-year season structure, and that's, that's that quantum leap. So, um, I mean, I, I don't know if I made that clearer, um, but uh, that pay-to-play is really gets to, especially the sheep, goat, and moose. It went to $100. Um, that's a disincentive to sit in Georgia some disincentive you could change that fee but if you don't buy a license you're going to pay the application fee and a hundred bucks but if you're a resident or non-resident and you buy a license under the staff recommendation you buy any license you would pay the application fee and a license fee for whatever you draw but you you would get a preference point <clears throat> not for an additional fee um, because they are participating, and they're, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Can I ask Dan a question? Yeah, absolutely, Commissioner McCann. You talked about the 100 bucks. You just want to make sure I understood correctly. So in the big three, they could pay $300 underneath the staff proposal. And if they don't have a qualifying license. And what we talked about today is they'd have to pay $100 for a license and $300 for preference points. So basically the same, just the difference being the qualifying license purchase versus paying the $9 application fee. If, yeah, if I understood what you approved is that, because you can't buy a sheep tag. So if I understood what was approved earlier is that you would apply, you'd spend your, let's take a non-resident, you'd pay $9 and you'd put in for sheep, you're not gonna draw it, okay? No, and we're going correct. You have to buy a combo hunting license first. Before correct, you get a plug correct, to be so. eligible. So you're in for some amount of money. You have to have a license. Some, and then you pay a hundred bucks. Then you pay a hundred bucks to get a sheep preference point. Correct. And and the the staff recommendation, I'm not dwelling on that, was you'd still pay your nine dollar application fee, and if you don't have a qualifying license, um, you would pay a hundred dollars. If you had a qualifying license, you put in for a license, you put in for sheep, you still won't draw, and you'll get a preference point. Yeah, and the, and the difference just being having to pay for the qualifying license. So it's because what you explained is perfectly it was uh, I think was um, really good, uh, Dan. In that you know, there's two different issues here. One's a preference point; the other's pay to play. Correct. And, then, and this, our system. And what we, we were raised those. What I was talking about was both those things, not just one thing. Correct. That's my, that was my under. Yeah, the recommendation was change the pay to play fee, and when you move that over into the preference point fee, it's confusing. And then and then the decision was it changed whether you're eligible. Um, you still had to have a qualifying license, but you threw everybody into the, you have to buy a preference point fee, not just people that didn't draw, which people that don't draw get a preference point fee now. You know, not everybody has to pay for one. That, that, that was a two significant big changes with, I think, very little discussion with sportsmen in the state, and I suspect um, you will hear about it. And I'll stay up here if I can help anymore. So let me just push ahead a little bit. So it seems to me we could just stay where we are, right? Now we all understand what we voted on. We could, to me, the point that Mr. Hildy made, the, the creep that I heard about this year was the big three. Also some on elk, but mostly on the big three. So I think another option would be to try it out on the big three where we had the most problem. Um, I'm not trying to twist anyone's arm. I'm just saying that would be another option. Um, and then the third option is obviously the staff recommendation, but um, it would be helpful to get a sense from the commissioners what they want to do. Well, Commissioner, Commissioner Daniel's Bryant. right. We're just kicking the can down the road. And if that's what we want to do, that's fine. Uh, Commissioner Bray, how would you feel about the fee? Is the amount of the fee? I think the, I like. I still like the concept. The fee's probably too high. Fee's probably too high. I struggle a little bit 
the big draw happens, or the application process happens basically the 1st of April. Yes, sir. It's really hard to buy a qualifying license. I guess you can buy a small game license from January to April, you know, because that's what you're going to have to buy. The fishing license is off the table. So, yeah. It's based, if I may interrupt, it's based on last year's license, I mean, unless you change that. It's based on what happened last year for a qualifying license, at least today. So I think we changed that by I, motion yes. to current year. You did. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, John, I'm getting Commissioner confused Gersari. too, but wasn't our original approach to this preference point fee to encourage those people to buy a license? That was the staff's approach, but the approach we <laughs> So now we've turned that into require the license to I, encourage you to buy a license. <laughs> I, I do believe in current, significantly in current recommendation, you've de-incentivized people because if, if you, I, I, I use an example, I'm no longer going to apply for an antelope. So I'm not going to send an application fee for antelope because I don't want to spend 40 bucks for an antelope. So I'll have to think about sheep, goat, and moose. So sheep, goat, and moose were the three that were, and hence why I would say why staff spent a lot of time, the difference between so the old pay to play was 25 or $40, and we went to 50 for resident or deer, elk, and, and uh, antelope, but we went to $100 to sheep to, again, incentivize, buy a license, or you're going to pay a lot more. So I would recommend if you're going to do both, as Commissioner McDaniel wants, I would recommend sheep, or sheep, goat, and moose, because you're you're talking about very few people ever drawing, and you know, it's it's all about preference points, all about preference. It's not about qualifying less. It's not. It is because you want them to participate every year. That's why pay to play is an effective model to encourage people to North American model participate. That's how you manage uh, this this resource, and that's why pay to play. We, have, we spent more time as a state about that issue instead of a preference point fee. doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just that was our way to encourage people to buy licenses. And you got a point if you didn't draw. But we're going to charge you more now for the application, now more for the license, and now more for pay to play because $3 was, you know, we changed the system. So. Commissioner Zimmerman, I think you had your hand up. What are the concerns with going back to the staff recommendation now that we've had this further discussion? Commissioner Haskett. Thank you. My concern is um, I like the pay to play fee, but if for sheep, goat, and moose, and elk, so it costs them $85 for, to apply for all four of those species. There's no pay to play for each species, basically, to me, especially for the non-resident. How is that going to deter them from applying for points for all those species? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to me like it's truly a pay to play for each species. So I, I guess I would like to see us either lower the fee, but definitely keep where they have to buy a license. Most states, you have to buy some kind of a license. Uh, again, I think under the pay-to-play, you, you have to or you pay the higher fee. But you only pay it once. <clears throat> per year, per species. No. You, when you buy a small game license, you, that's all you have to have, and you can then apply for sheep, goat, elk, moose, and you've only paid it one time. Yeah, then you're paying the application fee and, and or the license fee if you draw. Right. Sheep, goat, and moose, you don't draw, so you're, that's... It's back to it's back to that circle, right? I think I'd still like to see us at least for those pay something. I don't think we're deterring them at all by just making them buy a small game license. Mr. McDaniel, I don't remember who said it, but we're on both sides. I mean, we can't cure the problem. I mean, we we get we've heard comments now for months about how we messed everything up because we only charged three dollars for an application and we had a 400 percent increase now we're talking about trying to make it harder and all we're hearing is comments you're, you can't raise the price it's going to be too expensive um i i don't i'm not sure we can we can win yeah. on this one um and it seems like you know 
I just admit, I it's like I feel like I'm making things up to, for us to try to get to some place. Here's what I would propose. Think about. I really do advocate that you have to buy a license, combination, small game hunting license in the current year. You have to participate in our system to play. Um, and then maybe sheep, goats, and moose, they could give us a recommendation. Okay, I huddle for five minutes. What do you want? 10 bucks, 25, 50? Don't make it 100. Let's, you know, instead of ripping the band aid off, let's just take a little chunk um, to, to introduce the concept of a preference point costing money uh, in order to, to play. And again, that's not an uncommon concept in Western states that you have to pay for preference points. We just don't have to, have not done it before, and I can understand that's a big change. We didn't, didn't talk about it with the sportsmen. We can not do it at all and just open committees and or whatever and, and talk about it for a year and introduce that later. But I do think the qualifying license to me is critical, and it should be a combo license. Um, they call them general hunting licenses in most other states, uh, and you have to buy it in the current year. So with that, I'll, I'll give up. Okay, just to summarize where we are, I, we're going to need to take one action to remove the fishing license. And so I, if someone wants to make a motion to change, um, John, Commissioner it, Garcia. I, I just, Commissioner next to me here it, it did a wonderful motion last time on the park fees. Uh, I don't know that taking the recommendation and trying to find out if increasing the preference point fees dramatically actually results in what the proposal is, which is to increase those people actually buying the license that we're trying to get them to buy. So it's this or that. It's either your idea of a qualifying license with a low fee or the recommended high fee with no qualifying license to see if that results in people buying the license that you're asking they buy. Chairman? Uh, can we Mr. Prinslow. <laughs> if allowed to caucus, I'd, that'd be my preference. If not, I, I, <laughs> I could say that if I was you, my recommendation would be go with the pay to play. But if you would like to include or trial basis, do it on sheep, goat and moose and add and I'd look at Corey and add a preference point fee for only those three at a certain level and see how that goes. But I would still encourage you to do the pay to play because that's the disincentive for people to sit out and just do preference point into our system. That's, that really to me is, would be critical to maintain. And then you could have some discussion about should you charge some kind of an additional fee for those three that are, you rarely can draw but are highly sought after. Mr. Chick. Be quiet. <laughs> Afternoon, commissioners, chair, uh, Corey Chick, license and pass section manager. Chair, if you wouldn't mind, I can actually answer uh, Commissioner Garcia's Please. question on pay to play last year as far as those that were charged that fee. So for, for deer, we had 212,232 applicants, 45,569 were charged the preference point fee. For elk, we had 230,009 applicants. 47,665 were charged the preference point fee. For pronghorn, or I'm sorry, pay to play. Sorry, pay to play fee. Sorry for the confusion. It just makes me feel more human that you can make a mistake. <laughs> for pronghorn, 76,879 applicants, 10,708 paid the pay to play fee. And for bear, 31,971, uh, 3,531 paid the fee. So considerable. You have, you have the, the numbers for sheep, goat, and moose? There was no pay to play fee for sheep, goat, and moose, so oh, I don't okay. have those numbers. It would basically, uh, if, if we went on the, and I can pull the numbers what it would be, because if we went on the web and looked at total uh, applicants versus quota available, it's the inverse of the two. Okay. What would be the remaining would pay the fee. So if I may back up a little bit, what is Bray. the pay to pay play fee currently for deer and elk? 
those are the ones I'm concerned about. Uh, for deer and elks, forty dollars. Across the board, resident, non-resident. Correct. Well, we have one action item. Why don't we just take care of it? The qualifying license, um, as I understand it, we want to drop the fishing license from that. So the qualifying license would be the combo, the small game license, and the turkey license. So the chair would need a motion to proceed. So moved. Second. Um, Commissioner McDaniel moves. Uh, Commissioner Haskett seconds. Um, any public comment? Very good. Let's do a voice vote then. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So that, that little technical piece, do we want to change our earlier motion? We, do, we, we have to move on. I wanted to give us a chance to make certain we knew what we did because our email is going to fill up <laughs> either way. So does anyone want to change what we did earlier beyond what we just did? In the sense that we haven't vetted it with our constituents, we probably should uh, back off. So I would move to do that, and then I'm thinking of a substitute motion. So, uh, what I'm going to propose is we still keep the pay to play, the 7 and $9, uh, have to buy a qualifying license within the, in the year, and there will be a preference point fee for the big three. I would really, really like, if, if it appropriate, to include in the motion to look for 2020 to add the other species in some form. So that'd be instruction to staff to study that and present to us this time next year. And we, I think for that to be effective, we need to set a fee, right, for the, for the preference point. Sheep, goat, yes. moose. For sheep, goat, and moose. What was staff's proposal? I can't remember. One item of clarification on the, the fishing license change. I think the fishing license problem that Director Broshide brought up was just for non-resident fishing. So just a question to the commission on whether you'd still like to allow residents mm -hmm. to hold an annual fishing license as a qualifying license. I can never get past this issue. All right. <laughs> um, no, because uh, those are different federal funds. Let's have them buy a hunting license so, so, so it goes toward uh, the hunting side of the issue. Okay. So it will be the same, hunting uh, resident, non-resident. Thank you. Okay. So I think the only thing open then in your motion, Commissioner Bray, is we need a number because we have to act today. So I, I can't ask staff to make a recommendation in the future. Didn't staff have a proposal for a number uh, of for the big three? It was $50 for residents and $100 for non-residents for sheep, goat, and moose. I'll include that in my motion. Very good. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. A second? Second. Uh, second from Commissioner Garcia. Uh, public comment. Welcome to the podium. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner, Chairman, members, uh, somebody who's been involved in hunting in Colorado for multiple species for 45 years, involved in multiple conservation group, elk, deer, uh, turkeys, I, I have the opportunity to speak to dozens of sportsmen. I've been talking to them over the past year about r license fees, application fees, the vast majority of them are okay with raising fees, no problem. This is the first I've heard of, uh, and if I understand it right, if I put in for a license and I don't draw, I, I would then have to pay an additional fee to get a preference point. I can almost guarantee you that that one issue is going to cause some huge blowback to the department and to this commission. Because uh, I haven't had that come up in the last year, and I've been talking to people about raising the fees, trying to promote it, that we need the, the money to keep conservation efforts going. And 90% of the people I've talked to 
haven't been against raising fees. But this one issue, I can almost guarantee, is going to be very contentious. And do you think that's different if it's on the big three, sheep, goat, and moose, than if it's on the broader species? Because the I point would, creep is in the big three. It would three. have less impact there because there are limited numbers of people putting in for that. Um, but I still think you're going to the commission and the, and the department's going to get blowback from it. Um, but I, my personal preference would be if we're going to do this, even as an experimental thing, to do it on the big three. And then talk to sportsmen's groups around the state about the rationale and the possibility of doing it with other species. Very good. That's what we just did. Oh, I know. I understand that. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm taking that as support for the motion, and don't go any broader. <laughs> any other public comment? Okay, so we have the motion on the table. Is it clear in everyone's mind, or would you like me to have it read back? I think I see Commissioner Hauser would like Danielle to make an attempt. So, Sorry, Danielle. <laughs> no worries. Again, Danielle Eisenhart, for the record. Um, the motion, as I understand it, is that... Um, we're going to require a qualifying license to apply for any kind of a hunting license. And for sheep, goat, and moose, if you want to have a preference point, you have to pay $50 for residents, $100 for non-residents to get a preference point for those three. And we're asking staff also to study for next year, expanding that to all the species. Anything else? Great. Um, well, I think this is likely to be contentious, so let's let's go ahead and do a roll call vote on this one. Bray? Yes. Raquette? Absent. Garcia? Yes. Haskett? Yes. Hauser? Yes. McDaniel? Yes. Hepler? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Vigil? Yes. Zimmerman? Uh, if I can change my email address, yes. <laughs> Just kidding. That's a yes. Chairman Howard? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, everyone. <coughs> and you'll back on the, uh, on the agenda, please. So we're Before we go on, I'd like oh. to thank Dan for bringing that issue back up to us. It's not very yeah, often he straightens anybody out, but he did that to he owes us drinks all around. Yes, exactly. He has the beer tonight. <laughs> okay, that was Commissioner V. Hill, Bray, and House. Thank you very much. Okay, Daniel. So we're on agenda item number 16, which is Chapter W0, our general provisions chapter, and these are three issue papers. So they're just informational today. Um, they will be up for your final consideration in January. So the first issue paper on page one is proposing adjusting the boundaries for GMUs S12 and S78 to be consistent with the herd management plan for RBS-5. The proposed herd management plan for RBS-5 recommends that the area west of Highway 91 be included in with GMU S78 and that all the 10 mile range be included with S12. Along with this proposed herd, man herd management plan and GMU boundary modification, the agency is also proposing removal of all sheep within S78 due to overlapping sugarloaf domestic sheep allotment and likely disease concerns. The harvest will be achieved through disease management licenses. You'll hear more about that part of the proposal during the herd management plan presentation tomorrow. The next issue paper on page four proposes adjusting the boundaries for GMUs 3 and 301 to remove Moffat County Road 158. Moffat County Road 158 used to be open to public travel, connecting County Roads 3 and 5 in the past. However, it is no longer designated or open for public travel. This makes it a little more difficult for hunters to identify the boundary between these two units. While this is not a significant concern today, since the majority of our licenses for the area are valid in both units, it could become problematic in the future. The new proposed boundaries for both units would remain mostly unchanged, just with the exception of removing County Road 158. And the last W0 issue paper on page 6 proposes adjusting the boundaries for GMUs 56, 57, 58, 581, 69, 691, and 86 to utilize the Arkansas River instead of Highway 50. 
From a biological perspective, using the Arkansas River as a boundary makes much more sense and is also consistent with how the GMU boundaries are aligned further up the Arkansas River Valley. This would require modifying eight GMU boundary descriptions within Chapter W0. Those are all the W0 annual issue papers that I have to present. Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair. Thank you, Danielle. Any questions or comments? We can move on to the next issue. All right, my final regulatory chapter for you is agenda item number 17, which is chapter W2 Big Game annual issue papers, which are yellow in color. Again, these are informational at this stage. The first issue paper on page one proposes modifications to our leftover draw. Currently, the leftover draw is only open to customers who participated in the original big game draw. It's also restricted to just deer and elk lic license hunt codes. The result is that we have lots of remaining quota, even for deer and elk, and a very busy leftover license day. Changing the leftover draw to a secondary draw, where anyone has the opportunity to apply, as well as including Baron Pronghorn, would create more opportunity and may help many more of these licenses be sold during the draw instead of on leftover license day. This could alleviate load on leftover day both online and in our offices. It could also help lessen the time required for our reissue process. It could also enhance predictability with draw statistics that could be published similar to our primary draw. Some differences would continue to remain between the primary draw and the secondary draw under this proposed alternative. Um, preference points would not be gained or used during the secondary draw. Youth preference would still remain for the secondary draw, but landowner preference would not be applied. No group applications would be allowed in the secondary draw, and annual big game limits would remain in effect. The next issue paper on page four proposes modifying big game application deadlines and regulation. Currently, our big game applications are due from the public the first Tuesday in April for the primary draw and the first Tuesday in July for the leftover draw. Applications for these draws are not accepted before March 1st for the primary draw or for prior to June for the leftover draw. However, there's outside constraints that sometimes make it difficult from a technology perspective to handle the heavy loads on these particular days, including system constraints and blackout dates. These can change from year to year. Other conflicts can occur, such as holidays or that Tuesday being too late in the month for a timely draw to be completed. We understand it's very important for customers to have adequate notification of these deadlines ahead of time, but some flexibility would be beneficial to the agency. Additionally, changing the time deadline from midnight to either 8 p.m. or 4 p.m. would help ensure more staff time and vendor resources are available. The potential benefits are that it would provide additional staff time and flexibility, particularly for licensing staff. However, it would provide hunters with a level of inconsistency and need for strong communication from year to year. Over-the-counter and leftover product sale dates do change annually, so this illustrates that deadlines can be communicated to our hunters on a yearly basis through our brochures and online. Since this change or date needs to be approved every November moving forward, you'll see this is a final red line change in the W-2 document this year as well as in subsequent years if you approve. The next issue paper on page six proposes removing the preference point restriction for private land youth outreach hunts. The preference point restriction for youth outreach licenses is in regulation 206B4E2, and it's unnecessarily restrictive by making it impossible for landowners in units with at least one hunt code that requires six or more resident preference points to draw to allow organizations on their property to hunt with youth outreach licenses. This is one of the reasons that many of these available youth outreach licenses go unused each year. The purpose of the original regulation was to ensure that youth outreach hunters were not impacting public land hunters who had used a lot of points to draw a quality hunting license. However, if the youth outreach hunt was restricted to private land only, this should not be a problem. Therefore, this issue paper proposes as the preferred alternative, removing the preference point restriction entirely for youth outreach licenses, as long as the licenses are restricted to private land. A secondary alternative would be to allow youth outreach licenses to be issued in units with at least one hunt code that required six or more resident preference points to draw, as long as the youth outreach license is for private land only and is an antlerless license. 
This alternative would ensure less competition for male animals between youth hunters and the public land hunters. The next issue paper on page eight is proposing creating new novice hunter outreach licenses. So currently CPW's hunter outreach licenses are restricted to just youth. However, the agency has started to shift our priorities to target not just youth, but novice or inexperienced hunters of all ages. The current language puts limitations on these licenses for CPW, our partners, and other qualified organizations who cater to different groups of inexperienced hunters. For the purpose of this proposed regulation, a novice adult hunter would be defined as a Colorado resident, 18 years of age or older, who has either no big game license purchase history or only one consecutive big game license purchase history of five years or less, of which only one to three of those five years were big game license purchase years. This definition includes the terminology of license purchase years versus licenses purchased to accommodate new hunters who took advantage of buying multiple licenses in a single season more out of opportunity than means or experience. If approved, novice hunter outreach licenses would be distributed to organizations by the hunter outreach coordinator of CPW in a similar fashion to our youth outreach licenses with mirroring re regulations as far as the dates for which they can be used. Similarly, the next issue paper on page 11 proposes similar changes to ranching for wildlife regulations to accommodate novice adult hunting programs. Many of our current Ranching for Wildlife properties have expressed a desire to offer hunter outreach opportunities on their properties to novice hunters, particularly those that didn't come from hunting families or backgrounds. Currently, Regulation 210F allows youth hunting opportunities on ranches, but not for novice hunting opportunities. This issue paper therefore recommends as the preferred alternative expanding the regulation to include adult novice hunter license component as well limited to 15% of the total rants allocation. Another alternative would be to remove the youth altogether from 210F to allow the existing regulation to cover both youth and novice hunters. The next regulation on page 14, we're going into species specific issue papers. This one is for sheep, proposing a second bighorn sheep season in S42, which is the Waterton Canyon. After being closed to hunting in 1980 following an all age die off, the Waterton Canyon Sheep Unit was reopened to hunting in 2015 in partnership with Denver Water. License allocation has remained minimal due to potential conflicts with other recreationalists using the Waterton Canyon on both Denver Water and US Forest Service property. Currently there is a five day season with one RAM and one U license. And while hunting has been successful, the bighorn herd continues to increase and there is need for additional harvest. Adding additional licenses to the existing season could create crowding and raise potential conflicts with recreationalists. Therefore, this issue paper is recommending adding a second bighorn sheep season for the unit for both ram and ewe hunting. The second season would have the same requirements of weekday only hunting and a mandatory GMU specific hunter orientation training. Proposed second season, if approved, would open the Monday following the closure of the first season and run for five days. The next issue paper on page 16, we have talked about briefly with bears, making all bear licenses in DAUs B2, B5, B10, B14, B18, and B19 list B, as well as making all PLO licenses in B1, B2, B5, B4, B10, B11, B14, B17, B18, and B19 list C. Currently, there are only four bear DAUs whose licenses are categorized as list B. When licenses are categorized as list B again, interested hunters can purchase two of these licenses annually instead of just one. This is one simple tool to help sell more bear licenses to interested hunters without impacting hunter crowding. Besides the four current bear DAUs that are categorized as list B, another seven could be candidates to move into this category based on the portion of licenses that are left unsold. Beyond list B, the list C allows interested hunters to obtain an unlimited number of these licenses, which could be another management tool to be used on private land only in those units listed. Moving on to deer, the first deer issue paper is on page 18, proposing to separate GMU 9 from GMUs 19 and 191 and making it a list B with extended dates. 
Currently, GMUs 9, 19, and 191 are lumped together for the antler rifle seasons. However, the majority of hunters are harvesting bucks in 19 and 191 on U.S. Forest Service and state wildlife area property. There is need for more buck harvest in GMU 9 to help meet the buck doe herd management objective. This will also help to reduce CWD prevalence, which is the highest in GMU 9 out of the three units. Separating GMU 9 from 19 and 191 will help redistribute hunters to get more buck harvest in GMU 9. It will also add, allow Unit 9 season to be extended to November 30th to increase opportunity for hunters to harvest a buck in this unit. It will also increase the chance for Red Mountain open space access permit holders to draw a buck license for that unit. Therefore, the preferred alternative is to create one new List B rifle buck hunt code specific to GMU 9, opening the first day of the second rifle season and closing on November 30th. Simultaneously, GMU 9 would be removed from the existing second, third, and fourth rifle hunt codes that include 19 and 191. This management proposal is consistent with the Commission's CWD policy and the recommended WAFWA CWD guidelines. It's also consistent with the CWD response plan that you'll hear more about this afternoon. Moving on to elk, the first elk issue paper is on page 20, proposing eliminating late antlerless elk seasons in the San Luis Valley. For the past decade, elk populations in the San Luis Valley have been below population objective. Previously, in the early 2000s, elk populations were too high with lots of game damage concerns. To drive down the population, CPW had initiated late antlerless elk seasons starting in 2001, running the entire month of December, and increased antlerless elk licenses throughout the seasons. By 2006, elk herd management goals had been achieved with hunters and local constituents claiming that the elk population had gotten too low, especially on public lands. In response, CPW cut back licenses in these late seasons as much as possible, but kept the seasons open just in case it was needed again as a management tool. That need has never materialized, and in fact, the season has had unintended consequences such as impacting public land elk distribution. Therefore, this issue paper is proposing eliminating those late December hunt codes in GMUs 68, 681, 79, 80, and 81, and controlling game damage using other management tools. The next elk issue paper on page 22 proposes including a portion of GMU 79 in the San Luis Valley in the elk damage season. So while we're trying to grow the elk population in the higher elevations and public lands of the San Luis Valley, we're trying to do the opposite on the valley floor. The San Luis Valley is home to the largest concentration of center pivot irrigation crop circles in the world, which grow high value agricultural crops, particularly potatoes. To help control the growing elk population and mitigate game damage, a new elk DAU was formed in the early 2000s on the valley floor with an elk population objective of zero. This DAU, E55, includes GMU 682 and 791. As this elk DAU has a zero population objective, it also has some unique management seasons, including a PLO summer bull season from May 15th through July, and a PLO fall season for both bulls and cows that runs through February. These hunts have been largely successful, but the pressure has started moving some elk west into GMU 79 on private land within the Rio Grande River corridor. This area in 79 is also highly agricultural with thousands of acres of alfalfa fields. These elk are causing large game damage concerns in the excess of $20,000. Elk hazing and fall dis dispersal applications are not effective at mitigating these concerns during the summer growing seasons. The river corridor also provides lots of escape cover for these animals. So to address this summer damage, this issue paper proposes including that portion of GMU 79 south of Highway 112 in the San Luis Valley damage elk hunts for both the summer bull season and the fall and winter bull and cow season, while removing this portion of 79 from the other PLO seasons. A similar issue is also occurring in GMU 82, which issue paper is on page 25, and includes proposes including private lands in GMU 82 in these same San Luis Valley damage elk seasons. The valley floor in GMU 82 also grows lots of agri agricultural crops, including alfalfa, hay, and vegetables. And one of the main problems in GMU 82 is that there are several large refuges where elk are largely unhunted, including the Great Sand Dunes National Park and the Baca National Wildlife Refuge. 
These refugees make it difficult for CPW to reduce the herd. With elk present on the valley floor in this unit year-round and distribution management hunts not available until mid-August, mid new tools are necessary to harvest elk whenever available. Therefore, this issue paper recommends adding private lands within GMU 82 to both the summer bull and fall and winter bull and cow damage season for the San Luis Valley, while removing other PLO GMU 82 hunt codes for all seasons. The next elk issue paper on page 27 proposed removing the PLO designation for limited elk licenses in GMU 83. As previously discussed, almost all the land in GMU 83 is privately owned, and as such, all of our current limited elk licenses for cows and the first and fourth rifle season are PLO. However, a new 17,000 acre property is being opened soon called the San Luis Hills State Wildlife Area. So this issue paper recommends removing the PLO designation for these hunts to allow interested hunters to hunt this property as well with those licenses. The next issue paper on page 28 proposes changing the first and fourth season either sex rifle elk licenses in E16 to bull or cow only and limiting the archery season in E16 as well. DAU E16 is currently below its population objective and also has cow and calf ratios that are trending downward. While antlerless and either sex licenses have been reduced substantially in recent years as an effort to slow these population declines, additional efforts are necessary. Therefore, this issue paper proposes converting the first and fourth season either sex licenses in E16, including the PLO, to specified bull or cow only licenses and limiting the over-the-counter archery licenses to only bull licenses. Currently, either sex licenses in this DAU contribute a combined 24% of the total cow harvest, making them a significant contributor and barrier to increasing the elk population in this DAU. A secondary alternative would be to make the first and the fourth rifle season changes, but to leave the archery season as is. Moving on to pronghorn on Daniel. page. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Bray. Uh, excuse me, but <coughs> what units, I don't have that unit map in front of me, what units are E16? Let's see if it's listed in the issue paper. Thank you for the assist, Mr. Hildy. <laughs> so basically, it's the Eagle Valley. Yeah, and I can get a complete list for you as well during a break, Commissioner Ray. My apologies for not having that ready. Did you have any other questions on that one before I not move on? Not on that one. I, I'll have some comments at the end. All right, so we're on pronghorn, page 30. So those units are 44, 45, 47, and 444 are those for E16. Um, for pronghorn, page 30, we only have one pronghorn issue paper which is proposing to reopen pronghorn hunting in GMU 10. GMU 10 was closed to pronghorn hunting in 2010 following a drought and severe winter conditions of 20, 2007, 2007 through 2008, which drove the population down. And since then, the pronghorn population in this GMU has been on a slightly increasing trend. Public land is limited in this GMU, but there is opportunity for harvest of a small number of animals on public land. Pronghorn are also relatively abundant on the private lands, and therefore this issue paper recommends reestablishing two hunt codes, one for the public land and one for private land only, that were turned off in 2010 to create hunting opportunity for bucks on both public and private property. And the last W2 issue paper on page 31 is for Moose, proposing opening GMUs 53, 54, and 63 to limited bull moose hunting. 
Since moose were first transplanted to the Grand Mesa in the mid-2000s, they have been expanding their range to colonize new parts of the state. And moose hunting is currently offered in four of the five Gunnison Basin GMUs, 55, 551, 66, and 67, as well as several GMUs adjacent to the Gunnison Basin. Recent anecdotal observations of moose by CPW staff, landowners, and outfitters indicate that the resident moose population may have established in GMUs 53, 54, and 63 as well. Based on those observations over the last five years, managers feel that these GMUs could support some limited bull harvest. As densities of moose in these three units are likely on the lower end, agency staff would like to create a combined bull moose hunt code for GMUs 53, 54, and 63 which would be treated as another experimental hunt in the Southwest region, similar to those approved by you in recent years. Those are all the annual W-2 issue papers I had to present, Mr. Chairman. I Thank you, Danielle. Uh, can I ask the director just to talk very briefly? I think I haven't had a chance to update Commissioner Hauser um, in the, the interplay between GOCO, um, the, the, the pending GOCO transfer of the Nature Conservancy property the Grant, the Great Sand Dunes, the elk herd there, the refuge, and then what we're up to here. Do you, could you give just sort of a brief description about what that, that game damage issue is and why it's so important? Mm -hmm. I, I'll try to real briefly, but essentially with the, the land status that is in the, the, in the area uh, with being Sand Dunes National Park, there's a property that the Nature Conservancy owns with the uh, Zapato Men Mendoza, and but they're, they're, there's hunting that is allowed on that parcel right now. It's a growing elk population, uh, significant elk population. And so as, with the transfer of that land to the, to the Park Service, what that would essentially do is eliminate hunting. Uh, hunting is not allowed on National Park Service lands. It's allowed on, on recreation areas. This would be a national park. So that would remove a, the tool to basically you know, control, manage that elk population. And what happens is that those elk now go across the highway and start getting into ag fields. The commission is responsible for game damage. And it's not that these are just low value crops. These are high, high value seed potato farms. And so our concern with that, one, with the park, there's national wildlife refuges. With the transfer of this land, we're starting to see a perfect storm of of a significant amount of money that would come the commission's way to approve. And so what we've been working with the refuge, the Nature Conservancy, and the National Park Service to try to implement programs that will reduce that elk population to a point where we won't see them, you know, essentially expand that range and get into that high value agricultural field. Right now, uh, the refuge has, has done great work with Pat Dorsey and her folks and the refuge folks but as soon as the first shot goes, they all take off like elk do and, and run into the park and then somewhat creates a refuge for them and expand. And I think, Pat, I think the last numbers I saw was we're just under 5,000 elk that are in that country and growing. And so it's a big concern. And it's not that, uh, I don't want to leave you with the perception is that, that we're sh you know, shouting in, in the rain that there's, the National Park Service is restricted from allowing hunting on the National Park Service without congressional authorization. So that's kind of the, the, the issue that we're dealing with. And, and our concern, again, is, is, is seeing those game damage claims come our way for something that we can't really do anything about other than fence the, the entire freeway. So that's, that's kind of the predicament that we're in. I just wanted the, uh, the commissioners to hear, because it's unusual for us to say, well, here's a we're trying to eliminate all the elk. That's sort of not what we like to do. And so I just wanted you to have the background about why this is a special situation, the San Luis Valley. Right. Plus I could feel the former Commissioner Pizel on my shoulder here yeah. telling me to say something. So thank you, Danielle. Uh, thank you. Any comments or questions from commissioners? Commissioner Bray? Just a comment on the San Luis Valley stuff. It's, it's, that's good. It's, it's been a long time coming on reducing those cow elk numbers in season. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Danielle. That was quite a morning for you. Morning and afternoon. Uh, oh, right. We do have public comment on number 17. Please come forward, Mr. Hildy. 
Thanks again, Commissioners. Steve Vildy, Colorado Bow Hunters Association. I wanted to comment on a couple of the issue papers. And the first one is the first issue paper. And it has to do with uh, changing the big game leftover draw. And I just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention that this might be a really big deal. You know, there appears to be some great advantages to doing this. Uh, but there appears to be some drawbacks potentially too. And one of those that I'll point out to you is I've been a Colorado resident since 1984. And, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you know, you checked that box, you wanted to get your leftover list if you didn't draw. And the nice thing about checking that box is you got the leftover list and you were a priority. You, it was like a consolation prize. You were excited to get your leftover list. You had a priority to add some really good licenses. You look at the list nowadays, you know, not so much uh, when you start looking at the archery tags, but uh, we can't underestimate, you know, we went through the pay later transition. I think this could be very similar to it in that we're eliminating a priority. We're taking away the hopes and dreams and maybe the expectations of some of those consumers out there. And so, you know, having got this, uh, I've had some discussions with uh, Corey, and I don't know if he's available or would want to comment, but one of the suggestions, this is not going to be implemented until 2020, the way it's proposed. So I think there's some time there. And if you look at the back of the issue paper, everyone's affected by this. And the outreach that's been done in terms of the public outreach is just talking to random hunters over the years. And so what I've proposed to Corey is I've asked him to share this with the Sportsman's Roundtable, which I also serve on. And so I'd like to get commission support to do that. I think Corey's more than open to that because I'd love to bring some other guys in to discuss it and maybe look at some lower level data just to understand of the licenses on the list you know, I think uh, 2,500 were drawn, but there was a remaining quota of 33,000 today. And so is it just that the 2,500 are the coveted buck and bull tags? And if we could understand that lower level data, I think we'd love to do that. And I think Corey's open to that. So I don't know that this has a timeline attached to it. And after the discussions we've had today, Corey might want to push it back a couple of years. I don't know. But uh, the second issue paper that I wanted to comment on was regarding uh, DAU E16, which is Eagle County, it's some of Garfield County, it might even be uh, some of Route County on the southern end. And so what's being proposed is that uh, either sex rifle licenses for the first and fourth seasons be converted to antlered only, but they're also proposing that uh, the archery licenses, which are either sex, be also limited to antlered only. And so this one, uh, you know, I, I believe JT and some of the staff did some outreach at a local level, uh, but we had never really gotten notice of this one. And so this is in a two-step process and uh, JT and Craig, are ready to share some low-level data with us so the board, the CBA board, can get a better understanding of this issue and collaborate with staff to look at all of these options that are being discussed. And we'd certainly love to do that. I personally, in the last couple of days, read the DAU plan, the HPP minutes, the HPP habitat management plan, looked at the brochure, the sportsman's roundtable meeting minutes, and so I'd love to share the data with the board. And I don't know when this one's scheduled for final action. Uh, we do have a December board meeting coming up. Uh, I don't know if this is for January approval or what that is, but we've got the holidays coming up too. So I'd love to be able to uh, comment further on this and just kind of wanted to go on the record to say, you know, if there's some options here that we can collaborate on, we'd love to do that. So, Daniel, this is January. Correct? Right. Yeah. So that, that gives you a couple months, Steve, and obviously you know my phone number if you... Yes, yes. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is just my notice to the commissioners that I'm probably going to cannibalize your break. So if you need to 
need to hit the bathroom in the midst of our next session, that's fine. GOKO is up next. Um, let me, again, I'm just going to seize on this as a moment for, for the new commissioners. I am the sportsman's rep to GOKO as a board member. There are only two other people that could take my place. Uh, one would be Commissioner Garcia and one would be Commissioner Haskett. I have had this position now for four years. I think it's a really important position. It requires a lot of work. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's, it really is time for me to hand the baton off, I think. And so um, I've talked to Commissioner Haskett, Commissioner Garcia, you may want to think about it. It is a lot of work. Uh, I'm retired. <laughs> it requires, I think it requires you to become a sportsman's rep uh, on every issue because, you know, principally my role is to remind GOKO occasionally that there's some impact on sportsmen and we have some input. So that, that's something to think about. If you're interested, please see me afterwards uh, because... You'd always be avail available by phone, I'm sure. I, I would be. You won't need any help. GOKO is a great place to work with. So um, anyhow, Tony, I, I've stolen the intro there a little bit. So um, I'll, I've just put that seed out. Let's talk further. Uh, the, the floor is yours, Tony. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Director, my name is Tony Gerzik, and I'm the Section Manager for Creative Services and Marketing. And today, we're really excited to be here and talk a little bit about communication and marketing in Colorado Parks and Wildlife and GOCO. And we kind of combine these two presentations because GOCO and Colorado Parks and Wildlife, like the Chairman just mentioned, are really great partners, and we work very closely together. We try to coordinate on a lot of our marketing efforts and our outreach efforts where it makes we also work very closely with Colorado Lottery, who wasn't here today. Um, and I think today's presentation will help kind of show the, the wrap all these things together. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to invite Rebecca to take over. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners, Director Brushhead. Um, thank you for your time today. Um, we really kind of just talk about um, something that's very important to us as an agency and certain to us as the information and education branch, and that is the opportunity to increase awareness and trust through marketing communications for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, we really have two key commitments as an agency, and certainly in what we have tried to communicate about our agency, which is our role serving as the conservation leaders in managing the lands, waters, and wildlife of Colorado. Um, so, not unlike a lot of the private sector companies that you would be familiar with, uh, we use different channels and different tactics to achieve a similar goal as a branch. Um, so, as you can see here, um, my team in communication and public relations really focus on public outreach. Um, Tony will speak a bit more about some of the traditional and digital marketing tactics used by his team. Um, our education also includes a lot of formal and informal projects, so they will be looking at interpretive programs and or on the park level programs as well. And then things like our partners conference uh, give us opportunities as well. And that's certainly something that we rely on GOKO to do a lot of that partnering as well. Um, so while we are, of course, an enterprise agency, and we rely very heavily on sales to do the important work that we do, you'll note that the graphic we're displaying here does not include for our section. Our KPIs lie not only in the number of passes and permits sold, but really in the communication of the why and of Colorado Parks and Wildlife's mission. And so we really work every day to explain and educate people on um, you know, the work that we are doing and sharing um, how our wildlife resources must be perpetuated, the quality park system that we provide is so important, and why we provide these enjoyable and sustainable recreation opportunities for the benefit of all Coloradans. So in sharing and educating the importance of these goals, um, we're also explaining and trying to drive the um, relationship of stewardship to these resources that drive our economy, our health, our recreation, and our heritage, as well as the need for supporting them for generations to come. So while sales do drive that important work, it's the conservation of lands, wildlife, waters, and recreational spaces that really are our most tangible product. We want to understand, as a branch, how that message is being received. Determine what misperceptions are out there about our agency and how to address them. 
work to utilize our staff, our partners, our volunteers, as well as other outreach opportunities to ensure that the full breadth of work that we do as an agency is being conveyed to the public. We'd like to reinforce that in Colorado, experiencing these resources and enjoying the opportunities to be outside is something that everyone can and should um, experience. And in building these connections, appreciate the need to conserve them for future generations. So with this slide here, um, we are trying to show that while we are focused on that common goal, we do have different channels in order to um, reach those goals. So I'll let Tony speak a bit more to the marketing side as he wraps up the presentation, but you'll see here his brochures, publications, the blog, and some of those paid media opportunities really are the, the sales drivers within our branch. Uh, on the communication side, the website and internet are our big communication tools to the public as well as to our staff. Uh, we also obviously do quite a bit of press releases and media outreach in order to communicate our agency message and the work that we're doing on the ground. And you'll see here too, we have a lot of shared channels. So things like social media show a pivot in strategy as well as our e-newsletters kind of show a pivot in our strategy to make sure that we're speaking to our customers in the ways and about the topics that they are most interested in. Instead of being sort of a push down organization, we really want people to engage and feel that we are addressing the things that they do want to hear from us about. Rebecca, can I ask you a question? Um, just on, I'm not, this is, I already know the answer, but there's no advertising agency, no outside creative force, right? No. This all is of all in-house. All of the work done here is in-house. Thank you. So another thing that may be a good um, opportunity to talk about our shared crossover is that Tony's department will certainly build some amazing videos. If you haven't had an opportunity to go through our YouTube channel, please do, they're amazing. Um, but a lot of the promotion happens through both our um, digital marketing channels as well as the communication side. So I will focus a bit more here on some of these communications channels through our team. And again, our overarching goal is to really speak to people in the places and about the topics that they really care about. And so our social media and our e-news strategies are really good examples of how our teams work together to achieve those goals. Uh, from a social media perspective, we obviously have a statewide account that's run by Mike Delavaneri through Tony's team, but each of our regional PIOs have Twitter accounts as well. Um, they also all contribute to our Facebook page, so we are making sure that there is very good representation and we're speaking to people where they live and about the things that impact them the most. Um, we also work on Nextdoor, which is hyper-local. I couldn't possibly show you all of the different ways that we can communicate on Nextdoor because that's at a neighborhood level. So when we have things like a mountain lion um, in a neighborhood that we want people to be aware of, we can get right down to the actual neighborhood and talk to those residents specifically about what it is that we're trying to do. Um, it does help eliminate some of the confusion where people may not understand why we're there, why they're seeing badges, and also kind of helps give them a little bit of insight as to um, why we end up making some of the decisions that we do make on the ground. Our e-newsletter has also really kind of had that shift in strategy. So instead of kind of having one overarching newsletter that speaks to every possible thing that the agency does, uh, we ended up surveying over 180,000 of the people who have subscribed either to our e-news or to our previous insider um, and asked them, what are the things that are most interesting to you? What is it that you'd like to hear from us about? So we now have five different editions of our e-news and people are actually getting the information that they truly care about the most from us. And that can communicate anything from what's happening in the state parks, what they might be aware of uh, coming out of today's meeting, but also things like if there's a prescribed burn near a certain area, we can kind of get that out there through that as well. So it really is kind of giving the people the opportunities to, to select what they're interested in and to uh, uh, give us the opportunity to communicate the messaging that we'd like to communicate while we're talking to them. So from a communications and public information on our side, um, whoa, hello, here we go. Um, we have the opportunity to drive positive public perceptions and reputations through some of our planned messaging as well as some of our responses to crises. Um, we play many roles in that public relations management um, and by crafting the message that we really want to communicate to people both internally and externally. So PR really helps us project the voice of the agency and key messages through these media outreach opportunities. This here is an example of a press release that we just did in uh, combination with CDOT to give them an opportunity to weigh in with us on why things like watching for wildlife during daylight savings time is so important. 
Um, it gave us the opportunity to provide graphs and data that we would like communicated provide photographs that they could be easily used in their communication of these efforts and it makes life a little bit easier for the media folks to understand what we're doing because we're really able to serve up on a platter exactly what it is that we need for them to know and to understand about what we're doing. However, we also have these opportunities for crisis communication. Um, so when we don't have a situation that is planned for, such as uh, a elk that was giving birth on Lookout Mountain in front of everybody's live cameras in the Denver area, <laughs> or when we had a bear attack on a five-year-old in Grand Junction, um, it does give us the opportunity to educate as well. Um, while we're doing it a bit more reactively, it does give us the opportunity to also be transparent um, in our responses and provide follow-up when appropriate so we can explain to people um, you know, through DNA tests that we certainly got the bear we were looking for, or to explain to the media why some of the things that people may have an expectation of for things like you know, the difference between what happens with a zebra who's pregnant at a zoo versus an elk in public, why it's different, why we react differently, and why we make the steps that we make. <laughs> so as, additionally, as a communications team, we have tools that measure, again, sort of what people's perceptions are. So we can get not only um, a tracking of what type of media people are watching, what type of coverage we're getting, what that dollar amount translates to, but also, again, have the opportunity to see whether the perceptions and the coverage is negative or positive.